My name's Matt Long. I'm a trial attorney, a husband, a father, an entrepreneur, and a philanthropist. I have a long family and personal history with Mormons. Mormon is a broad term to describe many different groups, sects, ideologies, and identities that have some connection to Joseph Smith Jr., the first Mormon. Some of the largest and well-known modern sects of Mormons include the Community of Christ, a church started by Emma Smith, Joseph's first wife, based on the rejection of polygamy. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, a church started by Brigham Young, headquartered in Salt Lake City, Utah. This organization is a large corporate conglomerate with a man named Russell M. Nelson as the symbolic figurehead. There's also the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, headquartered on the border of Arizona and Utah. This church is currently led from a Texas prison by a man named Warren Jeffs. The Brighamite and Warren Jeffs branches of Mormonism claim polygamy as a spiritual doctrine. Over the last 10 to 15 years, there's emerged a new sect within Mormonism, a secular branch of Mormonism that's made up of many religious refugees with some connection to Joseph Smith and Mormonism. These refugees find common ground through their disbelief or separation from Mormon religions. These refugees find community through social media, discussion boards, podcasts, and in-person get-togethers and conferences. These individuals identify as ex-Mormon and are often very critical of Mormon theology and Mormon social practices. This new secular branch of Mormonism has influencers as leaders. These influencers use social media and podcasts to attract followers and ask for donations. Between 2012 and 2019, I considered myself a part of the ex-Mormon community of religious refugees and worked pretty closely with many of the ex-Mormon leader influencers. I was part of a now cringe-inducing podcast that didn't, until very recently, ask for donations. We were a group of guys that were trying to process our Mormon experience and doing our best to navigate our own humanity outside the religious paradigm. One of the most influential podcasters in the ex-Mormon world is a man named John DeLynn. One of the last podcast episodes I produced for my silly little podcast was in October of 2018, and I was critical of John DeLynn. This criticism was based on the multiple reports of misconduct from good people who worked for John. The people that worked for him reported financial and sexual impropriety and misconduct, which called into question John's honesty. One of the people I referenced was a person that worked extremely close with John. She went by the pseudonym Rosebud. This is Rosebud's testimony, Rosebud's record. In November of 2018, three or four of my podcast team began producing an expose of John DeLynn, which included the reports from multiple individuals close to DeLynn and a collection of documents. One of the individuals that agreed to be interviewed was Rosebud. Because of my background in law enforcement and the fact that I represent victims and those who are accused of crime, I'm very sensitive to false accusations. And because of my experience, I learned that one of the best tools in order to get to the truth of the matter is to have an individual who makes an accusation of misconduct, harassment, or impropriety to submit to a forensic interview by a trained professional. This type of interview is also known as a cognitive interview. Rosebud agreed to submit to that interview, but she had two conditions. She wanted to maintain the pseudonym Rosebud, keeping her true identity private, and she wanted nothing more to do with John DeLynn or ex-Mormonism. That project went nowhere for many reasons, one of which is ex-Mormonism became small, irrelevant, and quite frankly, pathetic in my life. When I told Rosebud about my decision not to engage in ex-Mormon spaces anymore, she was supportive and really felt no need to have her story released anywhere. Ex-Mormonism became for me what it had already become for Rosebud, a part of the past. But Rosebud's interview remained in my computer. In April of 2021, Rosebud informed me that John DeLynn and other ex-Mormon influencers had publicly named Rosebud using her real name. 
John chose to offer his narrative, and so Rosebud asked me to release her cognitive interview to clarify the record of her history with John DeLynn and John's treatment of her when he was her supervisor. I don't know what caused John to bring up her name, but he did. So here's Rosebud's testimony, her record, her Mormon stories and Open Stories Foundation experience. There are very few people in the world who may find this story, John DeLynn, or Mormonism in general, relevant or even interesting. But it is relevant to a small group of people. And to those people, Rosebud's asking to remain private. She's asking to be identified solely as Rosebud. And for Mormon and ex-Mormon YouTubers, podcasters, podvangelists, and wannabe influencers to please keep her identity private. I understand she's in contact with attorneys, not me, but others, to look into whether legal action is appropriate for the way she was referenced in ex-Mormon spaces publicly recently. Rosebud doesn't have a public platform. She's simply a single mom who's done more than her fair share on behalf of the ex-Mormon community. This is very possibly the only episode that will ever be released on this platform. And with that, I give you Rosebud's testimony. I know very, very little about the situation um, that you and Matt are working on. Um, in fact, I think we spoke of, in total about two minutes about it. So I, I know very, very little about it. Um, but what I can tell you in general is that um, this is pretty much what I do. I um, talk with people, I ask questions, I ask questions in very um, intentional ways. So if I ask something that maybe seems a little weird, there's probably a reason behind it. So um, hopefully it doesn't feel intrusive or offensive. It's pro there um, is a good chance that there's a specific reason why I chose the wording that I did. Um, that being said, if I do ask you something that is unclear or you're just not really sure what I'm asking you, I want you to be sure to tell me so that I can rephrase it. So if it's something that just seems kind of odd, but you can answer, I would like you to answer it. But if it's something that you're not sure what my question is, I want you to be sure to tell me that so that I can rephrase it in a different way. Okay. Um, if I ask you something that you do not know the answer to, I want you to just tell me, I don't know. I don't want you to try to guess or um, try to like, Put yourself in somebody else's shoes to try to answer answer for them. Um, I want you to just tell me I don't know. Um, I there's a good chance I might repeat myself or I might ask a question that sounds very similar to something I've already asked you. I do that for a couple different reasons. Um, one, I want to make sure that I'm actually hearing you correctly, but I also want to make sure I'm getting what you're telling me. I'm understanding the information that you're giving me. Um, and so I may ask you to repeat something or um, ask a question in a slightly different way to make sure that the information that I have in my brain is actually what you are trying to communicate to me. Um, and um, it's just really important that while we talk today, we're going to talk about the things that have really happened. So um, we both make that commitment to each other that we will only talk about the truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, setting aside the very little bit of information that I do have, I'd like for you to tell me what your understanding is in terms of um, our interview today. Well, I worked for the Open Stories Foundation under um, John DeLynn, who is a public figure who works in exposing the Mormon church. And he has a podcast at mormonstories.org. And he was excommunicated in 2015 from the Mormon church for what he said was his work 
in support of women and LGBT issues. And so we're going to talk about my sexual relationship with John Delin and how that began and progressed and ended and what has occurred since then. Okay. And am, am I hearing you right? Is it Delin? Yeah, D-E-H-L-I-N. Delin. Okay. And John is his first name? John is his first name. Okay. So tell me about um, how that relationship started. Um, well, I was very upset because I put this. So I grew up Mormon and um, I got married very young and my marriage was very unhappy and I had three children and, and I was very stuck in my marriage for reasons that you now already understand. Um, and in the, I guess about 2008 or 2009, I started interacting online on a message board and I hadn't I still believed in Mormonism to some extent but all throughout my teenage years and my adult years I was upset about um, sexual abuse that was happening in the Mormon church and I didn't believe that the leaders were really managing the problems well enough. And then I didn't believe that they were honest. So I always had issues, but I believed that the church was true somewhere. Like maybe it was corrupt, but true or something. But in the late between, and I guess around 2009, eight, seven, eight, nine, as I started interacting online and having conversations, I realized that the church just, there was nothing that was true. And I was in this awful marriage and I was in the marriage because of the church. And I'd I'd gotten into the marriage because of the church and I had to stay in the marriage and I had to like manage the situation with my ex-husband um, who wanted me in church and I wasn't in church and we were doing, we were having that sort of conflict and there was this podcaster and he um, was getting his PhD in psychology and he put out these um, requests for help. You know, I want volunteers. I want some, cause I'm going to, help people in the church, help people who are in your the situation that I was in, um, find community and manage life better. I don't, I guess I can't, he can, he's got podcasts, you can listen to his words, I can't repeat him. But so I, I listened to this and I was like, yeah, I really, I'm alone, I'm desperate, this is terrible, I would like some help. So I was like, okay, I'm going to email this guy. So I emailed him and um, he responded to my email and um, I, I wrote the email at a time where he was getting a lot of public criticism. I think for, um, I can't remember the exact circumstances, but it's all on the public record. Some, something that he'd said to Marlon Jensen, or about Marlon Jensen, who was about LGBT issues. And so I, I, I said in my email, you know, I, I think you're being treated unfairly and obviously you're doing good things. And that, anyway, he, that, I, I don't know if that flattered him or what, I, I guess I can't take, make any assumptions about him, but um, I, I ended up volunteering to help him with some of his projects and um, he, my, my ex-husband, my now ex-husband, I was married at the time. My children and I actually went to his home in Logan, Utah, where he was working on his PhD in psychology at Utah State University to just meet because I was going to help him on a book series. And so for me, I was, this was, this was great. Like I, I, I was having an opportunity to get involved in Mormonism and do some things that I felt was really, would really be good and beneficial to the community, but it was also good for me myself because I'd been a stay at home mom for so long. I was just beginning my um, 
master's in psychology at Harvard Extension School. And, you know, it just seemed like a, a good thing. <laughs> so after my family met John DeLynn's family, um, John invited all of us to go to New York City for the Book of Mormon musical, right when it was coming out. So this was before it was popular. It was in 2011. Okay. And um, so my, my husband and my children and I drove to New York City and we went to a conference and we went to the Book of Mormon musical and my husband was really, um, he was trying to be supportive of me, even though he believed the Mormon church was true. He knew I didn't. And we, we were trying to manage, of course, we were managing a lot of other things, but <laughs> um, so he came to the Book of Mormon musical with me. And of course I was cheering because I thought the musical was great. And he was just like, he had his head and his forehead in his hands and he was just drooping. Like this is off the most awful, awful, sacrilegious, horrible musical ever. You know, because this is just our relationship. This is how different we are. And um, the next day after the musical, and Laurie Goodstein made a report, you know, wrote up the musical and put it in the New York Times because that's why we were there was for the Laurie Goodstein publicity. The next day we met at Planet Hollywood. And <coughs> while we were there, um, <coughs> John immediately came over to my husband and I and he'd been texting me a little bit um and we'd met in the we'd met in a restaurant the night before and he like immediately came over and gave me all of this attention while my husband was there but this time he came over at planet hollywood to my now ex-husband and I and he he sat across the table from my ex-husband and he just like interviewed him and asked him all of these questions to try and figure out what it was that my husband thought about the ex-Mormon or Book of Mormon musical, which of course my ex-husband hated it. Just um, figuring out what he thought about religion and whatever. I didn't listen to the whole conversation. Those are the parts that I remember. Um, and then my ex-husband got up to <coughs> leave, take the kids out to see Eminem world. And John sat across the table from me and he asked me what I thought needed to happen in order to progress the work for progressive Mormons forward. Um, and we'd all had this, this was a time when there was almost no communication between Mormons who didn't believe right now. I mean, we've got, there are a hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, a hundred thousand people on, the ex-Mormon Reddit, and there's just this huge community, et cetera. But this was a time when we were all kind of like myself at home, quiet, not daring to tell anyone that we didn't believe the church was true, because if we did, there would be social consequences, mm -hmm. and we didn't have community. And so we had come together in New York City, and it was just kind of like this first time that there were all of these, for many of us, at least that's what people were expressing over dinner, et cetera, for all of us to just be together and have community and be able to talk about it and say, guess what? I don't believe the church is true. No, I don't believe it is either. Like have just have that good camaraderie feeling like, wow, we're not so alone. And so at Planet Hollywood that day, and I was like, well, I think what you need to do um, since you've got this podcast, you've got all these voices and all these people helping you is you need to <coughs> put together a network of Facebook communities and empower people to put together their own social events and their own conferences. Because if we do that, then we can create this community feeling that we're having here in New York city throughout the entire United States. And we can get all of these people because we know we all, we know we all exist quietly in our little corners, not daring speak, but we need to do is bring people together in some sort of organized way so that they can, find that community themselves. And we don't have to do all the work because he had been complaining about how it was so hard for him to plan that conference and that, that we had attended because we went, attended the Book of Mormon musical and a conference. It was so hard for him to plan that conference. That, and I was like, well, you don't need to plan it all because you've got all these volunteers. You just need to organize it. You just need to give people, empower people 
and it will work. Um, and so he agreed with my idea. He was like, okay, that sounds, that sounds like a good idea. Um, but when I got up to leave the table, he, um, he stood up and he started crying and he gave me just this long, long, long hug. And at the time I was like, I mean, I, I knew by that point in time that he was hitting on me because I'd gotten some texts and, um, because at the conference the day before, like he would just kind of stand against the wall. I don't know. I'm trying, I'm thinking the word sulkily, but that's not really what it is. But I'd like see him just looking at me, um, eyeing me. And he'd, he'd invited me to come to a discussion before the conference that was only for some select people the day before. So it was like giving me these privileges and he was looking at me and then, of course, he singled me out at um, Planet Hollywood. And then he interviewed my husband and then made whatever, drew whatever conclusions he did from that. And then um, at the end of that, he just gave me this really long hug. And so I went home with my husband. We drove back to Boston. And the next, must have been the next morning, um, I guess I don't know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, weekend, but it, the next morning, well, on a Monday morning, because my husband wasn't there, I was at home. I know that. So my husband would have been off at work. Um, he called me and he just, he apologized for being so creepy at Planet Hollywood. And he's like, I shouldn't have done that. And um, I was kind of quiet. And then I was like, well, okay, let's build these Facebook communities. Like we had this plan. I wanted to make sure he was really empowering me with the plan because to me, this was a great plan. We have all these people, they need to get together so that we don't all have to be so lonely. Let's build a nationwide network of progressive Mormons and stop all the suffering that we're going through in our isolation. And so he empowered me to do that. And I got on Facebook and he started creating Facebook groups and I started creating Facebook groups. And this was before Facebook groups. You know, this was kind of an original idea back in the day. It's not an original idea now, but it was an original idea then. And we, um, we I was able to, with his help, immediately start, because he had, um, he knew a lot of progressive ex, well, I guess progressive Mormons, whatever, from around the country already, because he'd done some previous traveling. So as we started creating groups in all these major cities in the United States, and he started popping people that he knew weren't believing Mormons into those Facebook groups, and they'd bring their friends in. And then it immediately, fairly immediately went international because, well, what about the people in Sweden who don't believe? So then there was a Swedish Facebook group. And then we, I created a, um, a Facebook group for the admins of all the Facebook groups. So we had like this secret Facebook group where we could all talk to the leaders of all the groups and get everybody together so that, you know, and then people, it was like, it was maybe the beginning of the Facebook, I guess kind of like a, I don't want to use the word rebellion, but that's what we were doing. And so it was very, very exciting and empowering for me because I went from being alone um, in this awful situation to having um, this connected place with all of these people doing what was really, really important to me. And, you know, from my perspective, because I, as I said, I'd been concerned about child abuse, et cetera. I was like, look, I, I get how this works. First, we've got to take care of the gay people. <laughs> Then we'll have to take care of the children, of the women because gay people have men and LGBT rights always come first. And I really, I support that. I care about them, but then we'll have to take care of them. And then maybe we can get to the kids because that's the hardest, you know, it's kind of like a power thing. And I was like, so we've just got to start empowering people to speak about this, et cetera. Um, so after that happened, um, I just, I really had a lot of ideas about how to move <laughs> this forward because I've been sitting around thinking about it. I'm very much a people watcher 
Um, I ended up getting my master's in psychology. I really like social psychology. I like watching the way groups interact. And I was like, look, if we're ever going to get people working together to um, one of the things that made me really mad was that there just wasn't in my mind, an adequate child protection policy. Mm. It's like, if we're ever going to get people together so that they can work together to keep kids safe, then we've got to have believing Mormons and un- non-believing Mormons like being friends rather than always fighting each other. Cause we've got to, you know, I don't believe you do. That doesn't mean we have to hate each other. And in Mormonism, that's a really big part of the culture. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if you don't believe anymore, then you're excluded. And I really wanted to try since all of a sudden I had some influence and especially being a Mormon woman, you're used to never having influence. I wanted to try and create a, a community experiences, I should say, where believing Mormons could sit alongside unbelieving Mormons and LGBT Mormons and whomever, and they could all just be like, wow, we actually have more in common than we thought. And we don't have to, we don't have to hate each other or exclude each other or whatever. We can like have this be a good experience. So I spearheaded the drafting of some shared values that I thought all Mormons could Um, agree upon. And then I spearheaded, we'd had all these communities now that I had envisioned and helped create with John's help. And then I was like, well, we should, we can get all of these communities organizing their own conferences and we can, we need to try and make those conferences safe so that both believing Mormons and unbelieving Mormons can go to them and they can share their stories and they can agree that they feel emotions for each other's stories um, positively even though they don't believe the same thing to kind of try and fight that, what I believe, what I see as the tendencies of exclusion. Um, we don't have to agree on everything, but we can all sit in the same room together. So that was really, really my objective with these conferences. Um, so we ended up, <coughs> so, but also during the same time period, John is, um, definitely hitting on me. We're talking about sex. Probably. I, I assume I did. I have some Facebook messages between us. Um, but just based on my memory, which the documents are better than my memory, but I, and, um, the, yes, I'm trying to figure out what's important to say, but so while I, I'm planning this conference and, John and I are getting to be closer friends and I have to fly from Boston out to Salt Lake city to the conference. And I, I ended up doing that. And, um, I can't remember right now if we talked about, no, I think we had, um, he, him getting a hotel and, um, well, I guess no, the hotel would have been for me because I needed a place to sleep because I was helping run the conferences, but him coming to the hotel, but us not doing anything sexual. And I believe in that case, in this first time in Salt Lake city that I had agreed to that beforehand. Like I was like, yeah, I, I want, I, this man in my, from my perspective was treating me better than I'd ever been treated. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess I could get into sex in my marriage, but that's not really important at this point in time. But I was like, yeah, I'll, I will let you into my hotel room and we're not going to have sex, but I will, I would appreciate some physical affection. So we did that first conference. He just hugged me. Um, It was just that only. Um, And it was just a, a good experience. (laughs) I, I, I didn't really especially feel very guilty about um, what was going on with my husband at that point in time. He had given me, um, I told him I wanted a divorce, but I've been telling him I wanted a divorce for years, but he had given me like some sort of, I don't know, 
well, really what he said was, you can go ahead and have sex with anybody you want. You can, he, he called me a lesbian. He was like, he told me I was going to have sex with women. I'm just straight. I mean, so, but that's just where we were. And his, my husband was like, well, his position was that once I went and did those things, I would realize how awesome he was and come back to him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that's, he just wasn't aware of me because he's, he just doesn't, he doesn't have that ability, but I didn't know that then. I just, anyway, so I wasn't really feeling very guilty about it. Um, but I was feeling like, yeah, but John's telling all these people he's one thing and this is different than what he's telling people. Um, cause he was very much always talking about how he was just such a family man and, you know, he was all worthy or whatever. I'm like, yeah, but we're, you're, you're taking this woman into a hotel and even though we're not doing anything sexual, that's not who you are portraying yourself to be to the public, you know, so even from that. I mean, yeah. So that's just how I say that that was my experience of, and that was in June of 2011. Okay. And that occurred and it's, it's pretty, I mean, this, this is pretty, when I talk about it, it's pretty easy to date some things in my memory because you know, if that they're associated with a conference that happened at a certain point in time, then I know, like, if I'm not, as I'm talking about this, if I'm like at home when something happened, and I don't really know when it was, because, but if I was at a conference or someplace where I was, then I can date it. Um, so that occurred. And then the conference was this huge success. And it was, as I had envisioned, I got up at the beginning of the conference, I read these shared values, we had people stand up and share their feelings about belief. And then we had other people stand up and share their feelings about disbelief and everybody got along and they were like, wow, what just happened? We had gay Mormons sitting on the bench next to straight Mormons and believing Mormons and unbelieving Mormons. And guess what? We all get along. And which was exactly what I wanted to have happen. Um, so it felt like just this great success. And then it was immediately like, well, we need to take this to all our other cities because we don't need to prepare these conferences. That's, I set it up to empower other people to prepare their own conferences based on the structure that we had given them. That made sense. Mm -hmm. So then um, there was a conference in San Diego and that one, I didn't, I didn't have much um, connection with that one, but then we did. And that just started this array of conferences, I guess we should say. Um, but in, must have been August, although again, just look at the, rec the public record <coughs> of the same year, so a few months later. And I'm still a volunteer at this point. I'm not getting paid anything. Um, and it is a 501c3. But for me, I was like, this is a good opportunity. I'm, stu I was, I'm a student, so I've been a stay-at-home mom. I was just starting my master's degree. It kind of fit with what I was doing. <coughs> um, and so, <coughs> but in August, um, John wanted me to come to a, another conference in Salt Lake City where he was, well, it wasn't a conference. It was a pod, a live podcast interview. So it wasn't really my thing because I was into the conferences, um, but it was a live podcast interview of a Mormon historian named Michael Quinn. And he wanted me to fly in to read the introduction or to give the introductory part. And I was like, look, I really want to do this because this is a great opportunity for me, but you don't need me. There are lots of people in Salt Lake City, and I'm not, I guess these are my thoughts, um, but there were lots of people in Salt Lake City who are capable of introducing Michael Quinn before the podcast, right? I don't, you, you don't need to fly me there. Um, but he was like, no, you're, you're the only person who can do it. And I was, and I remember thinking at that point, you're lying, you're going to seduce me. <laughs> That's what's going to happen because this doesn't, this isn't fitting. Um, and 
so I was like, okay, but you have to promise to not, you know, I, I know we did that in June in the hotel, but I don't believe that's what's going to happen if we go to a hotel again. Like, it's going to be more if we go to a hotel again, because there is this chemistry between us. And, um, you know, so promise that you're just, you're not going, you're not, you're not, you're going to leave me alone. I'm going to fly in and then I'm going to go to my hotel myself and you're going to go wherever you go. Um, so, but that's not what happened. And I, so I flew in and, um, you know, he, he just started like rubbing my back and, um, and we went to Liberty park. And that's why I said rubbing my back. Cause I just have this memory of sitting on this bench with him at Liberty park. And he's just like, um, just convincing me to let him into the hotel. Okay. So I did. I let him in my consent. Um, and um, we, I had, we had our first sexual interaction there. We did not have sexual intercourse, but it was naked. Um, and, you know, for me at that point, I was like, wow, that was actually the best inter- sexual interaction I've had my entire life. Um, and, um, he, he, that day, he published a, a podcast that, um, which actually I had really encouraged. I had found this, um, this man named Michael Coe did a podcast with him on book of Mormon historicity and um, he had recorded it earlier after I found this. So I was managing the conferences. Not this, well, and I actually, anyway, I guess not all these details are important. But so after that sexual interaction, he was just so angry with the church. At that moment, I don't know what was going on, that he podcasted, he podcasted this controversial podcast, which I thought was good because I thought it should go up. Um, this is going to take forever unless I get to what's important. Okay. 8.52. Um, we might have to come back. I have time now. How much time do you have? I have all the time in the world. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't have anyone home right now, so. Um, so that, that would have been in August of 2012. 2012? No. 2011. And earlier on this video, I think I said 2012 too, but that was wrong. I haven't told you anything about 2012 yet. So that may be the wrong date back then, but there is a public record. So we went to the Book of Mormon musical in March of 2011. This conference in Salt Lake City was in June of 2011. Okay. And then this occurred in August of 2011. Um, and so after that, um, the things, there was a, a conflict over a new conference. So John has a lot of ideas. People who work with him know this. And his ideas are all over the place and he doesn't have enough focus. And he keeps bringing in new ideas and trying to make everything happen, but he's not really good at doing the work himself. Mm. And so if you want to get anything done, and clearly I had some really strong objectives, I knew where I was going and why and what I wanted to happen. If you want to get anything done, then you really have to manage his tendency to be going in too many different directions and also sabotaging things while he's making them happen. So there was another conference that we were planning, which again, turned out to be a really incredible success, um, which was, I, I took my idea of, but which I had done with the conference in Salt Lake city and then had, we were also doing one and we did Washington DC anyway. Of, and I applied it over to an LGBT community. So we took the same shared values, et cetera, and had the same sort of conference um, structure adding some workshops um, and 
again, it just, I'm just really good at organizing things. It just, it was this amazing success. We had like 350 people come in. So this was in November of 2011. So again, I guess like what I was trying to, I think what's significant in my memory about this is that like John was both trying to support the conference and sabotage it at the same time. And I don't really have a lot to say about that necessarily, besides it was, you know, obviously I'm in this, in this awful situation. I'm a volunteer. This guy's a public figure. He's lying to the public about who he is. And now at this point we have had a sexual interaction, right? So now it's not like we just hung out in the hotel. But now you're still telling everybody you're this great family man. And I know that's not true. And at the same time, I'm also really, really invested in this work, what I want to do. I want to do this work. <laughs> um, it's important. And then on top of that, I'm being successful with it. Um, and what do you mean when you say he's trying to both support it and sabotage it? Like, he, there was involvement from some, initially some gay people who were going to be part of the conference. There was this man named Doug Balls. And he and John put together a plan but then Doug started bailing because he didn't think it was going to be financially viable. Then John started bailing because he didn't think it was going to be financially viable. Mm. And I was saying, this is a 501 C three. Um, the whole objective isn't only finances. It's also to be supportive of the community. And, and so he would like, it was, it was mostly based on his finances. I think, you know, his, what is, how much money is this going to make? Was, but I also, I bring it up as well because, you know, I obviously don't know what is in his head. And frankly, you know, now, now looking back, I have a different kind of insight than I did while I was moving through it. But, you know, obviously a lot of things that he said to me weren't true. So, you know, but I think it was maybe or I, it was definitely financial sabotaging versus not sabotaging. And then I can't say for sure if I'm putting this thought onto him or if this was really his thought, but conflict over, you know, Anne or not Anne. I don't know. Okay. Um, and I don't think that my memories of what he said to me are really valid memories of what he was really thinking because what he was saying and what he was thinking were, I'm sure two different things. Mm. Um, if that makes sense. So, um, so we did, we went to a conference. This is confusing, but we went to a conference in October in Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. And we did have some, and he, and this is, this is the part where it's, you know, this is consensual. I'm enjoying it. Um, he, I just have a memory of like, we're in a parked car somewhere and he's putting his hands down my pants. Um, and it was flirtatious and fun, but it was also like scary too, because it was like, he, he wanted to get caught, but he didn't like, he was playing with, I might get caught. And that's exciting sexually. And that actually happened in, um, in um, August at the Quinn Conference in Salt Lake City too. I, I remember him, he was like, let's go, find a, let's go find a room here in the church. And I was like, that's crazy. I mean, we're already like, this is bad enough as it is. You're telling the public that you're Mr. Family Man and you're playing with getting caught right now at an event where there are all these people around and I'm, you know, it was, so there was something, there was something I think that was erotic with that for him. 
which was of course very scary to me. Um, so yeah, I'm glad this is being recorded. So that, that was in, so anyway, so there was the Quinn conference. And then what I told you about the car was in the wash at the Washington DC conference, which would have been, um, probably October, September or October, 2011. And then the circling the wagons conference, which was the LGBT conference was in November of 2011. Okay. At that conference again. Um, so this time it, it was different. Like before the Quinn conference, I had made him promise not to seduce me when we got to Salt Lake City. And then he broke that promise and he seduced me. And then I think before the Surfing the Wagons conference, <coughs> I guess I can't remember for sure. And it's interesting when I went back to find emails because we did a lot of the communication about these things um, in writing. <clears throat> I didn't find any Gmails about what our plans would have been for meeting each other. Um, and I, now I'm wondering if that's because he knew that Gmail was going to be around a lot longer and that was, he was creating a stronger document chain. Um, and of course that's not, I don't know, <laughs> but I just noticed when I went looking for those texts or that written conversation that I remember having that I didn't find it. Hmm. Um, and the only ones I found <clears throat> from early on were ones that had been Facebook messages that I had copied and then emailed to myself in Gmail because all of the old Facebook stuff is gone. Like it's gone in the ether or wherever. Um, and I didn't save my text threads. He might have text threads. So I guess I can't really remember right now whether before the Circling the Wagons conference in November, I said, don't come in. My guess is from my memory today that I was like, no, you know, like we already had the sexual interaction. I'm doing, I don't know what's going on. That was good for me you're invited to my hotel. Um, although actually I do have a memory because the, in the end, the circling the wagons conference was very financially profitable. After all those worries, I figured out all these ways to make, um, to, because he, he was so concerned about that to make it so that people were donating what they wanted to donate. Cause the, the issue was, look, these are some really needy people. We can't charge them an expensive ticket. But John was like, yeah, but if we're not charging an expensive ticket, then why are we doing it? And so I was like, well, we're going to allow people to donate as much as they want. And we're also going to allow people to come for free. And everybody can pay $10. If they really can't pay $10, we'll let them in for free. And that really got people to donate. So people were just pulling out $100 bills at the door. I mean, so at the end of the conference, there was this Um, big thick envelope of cash and this this memory actually answers the question about whether or not I invited I said or super four because I can't remember that but I can remember this um, <clears throat> we were sitting outside my hotel in Salt Lake City <coughs> and um, he was looking at this envelope and he was so excited about all the money that was in the envelope and he was like aren't you excited about this too and I was like well I mean, it's not my money. And, um, and then he, he said, he asked me then if I, he could come into the hotel, which tells me that I asked him not to seduce me again um, because I'd said no, but he's always trying to change no to yes, right? And, um, and I just remember him looking at me and saying, you know, you know you're giving your consent to this. And I said, yes. And he's like, you know this isn't quid pro quo. And I said, yes. I agreed to those things. And then he came into the hotel and we again, didn't have sex. And it wasn't as amazing of course, as the first experience I had in August. Cause I guess that's just how it works. But, um, but we were developing a close relationship. So that was November of 2011. Okay. <coughs> then, um, We went from there to me being like, okay, I loved this conference thing. Um, and it's time to just take these conferences to all the, to, to more regions. And somewhere between November 
And again, my memory is best when I can associate it with a place that isn't home. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess moving on to what I have memory of um, is that with John, you know, I, I wanted to continue the conferences and keep doing that. And I knew now based on the pattern that if I said no beforehand, he was going to try and get me to come in to change no to a yes. And I became more like, no, we have to not do this um, because I want to do this work and I care about you and this has been whatever it's been, but this is messed up. Um, and I don't know, I can't really say how much, you know, this just life and the reality played into what my thinking suicide. I don't know. Cause I just can't remember that. I remember. So I guess the next thing that's really clear in my memory is we're preparing for the conference in Houston. Okay. And that was in January of 2012, I believe. And it's easy to look at public record for that kind of stuff. Um, And now the board, the Open Stories Foundation board, has witnessed at this point that these conferences are are successful. And they know that I'm the one doing the work. Mostly, I mean, John's keeping the podcast going, but I'm actually also helping with the podcasts at times, getting the guests, et cetera. And these conferences are a lot of work. So they want to put me on payroll because that's fair. And so I, I was like, well, look, you know, I'm going to become an employee. This is bad. I want the job. It's got to be over. Um, And so that was before the Houston conference. And I was more firm and more serious about it this time. Like this has got to be over. And we talked about whether or not I would get a hotel and he would stay at the host's house or whether I would stay at the host's house. We didn't have to pay for a hotel and the host's house was huge. And, um, you know, he agreed that he wasn't going to come into my room and that I was going to be at the host's house and he was going to stay out of it. And, um, He, we went there, we had dinner with the host family and talked about whatever we talked about. And then I went to my room and I went to bed and he came in and his hands were under the sheets and I consented or like I have a memory of him. I have a memory of him sitting against the wall. I have a memory of at first having his hands under the sheets. Um, I have a memory of standing with him in the room with the light on. Um, And there were some, I have a memory of some more just kind of erratic behaviors in the home, like him trying to get caught or make it really dangerous that we're going to get caught. So like, I'm terrified. I have a memory of hiding under a bed. Um, And then I was just bawling. Like now I'm like, I'm in so much trouble. Like I'm employed and I I have a memory of just, and I'm so, I was just, I was so sexually confused. Like this man was, I loved him, but he was being awful to me. Like that's awful. And um, of course, I didn't know what was going on at home. I was just awful at home. And, um, and here was this project that I'd created and I loved that I'd been wanting to be part of my whole life. And now I had this opportunity to be part of it. And, um, I just, I wasn't okay. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't what it, what it had been before where you know like as I was speaking about in 
Um, yeah. So, um, you know, and I also remember before this Houston conference, one of the things that really, <coughs> um, he, you know, like at this point I'd figured out before the Quinn conference, when he said, you're the only person who could do this. I was like, I'm not the only person who can do this. I really was in a lot of ways, the only person who could run these other conferences. And there was a reason for me to be there, but I hadn't really, I hadn't really put together when he was lying or not lying then besides that one time where I had caught him, you know, now it's looking back. I'm, it's easier to see the manipulations, but at the time I was just being manipulated. Like, you know, he loved me or whatever. Like, I forgot where I was with my train of thought. I mean, yes, the last, I was going to say something, but I can't remember. Um, Yeah, I can't remember what I was going to say. So that was in January. Um, I guess I've, I'm, I'm just thinking through my thoughts about what do I do in this situation? Like, I, I can't trust this guy to leave. Oh, I was going to say something about him using the word repent. That's where I was going with that. Because like, what's a lie and what's not a lie? Before the, because it's a Mormon word. Before the Houston conference, he was like, no, we've repented of this. I've repented of this. I'm like, well, it's not really repentance unless, you know, you like tell your wife or, you know, things that are, things that, you know, your, your dishonesty with your wife and my dishonesty with my husband, these are two different situations and I've got to deal with mine and you've got to deal with yours. And, you know, repent isn't really repent if it's not repentant, but he would, he would say, no, we've repented. So therefore it doesn't matter anymore. Like, I think that's where I was going with the ideas about the lies, you know, the Quinn lie versus the repentance lie. And I'm like, well, I'm in this awful situation. Um, <coughs> so, um, the next conference was Phoenix, I believe. And that would have been in February because I'd organized this so that it was we could have a lot of conferences because I was just managing the volunteers and the volunteers themselves were putting it together. I'm like, we've got all of these people who are willing to work. They can do the work. We just have to manage it. And John was always so upset about how these conferences would reflect on him and his public stiff figure shad status. Cause yes, to put it bluntly, everything's about him to John. So um, anyway, we, when we went to the Phoenix conference, this time I was like, I don't trust you. <laughs> like, no way. I'm not staying at the host's house because I know that if I stay at the host's house, you're going to sneak into my room even if you quote repent or you promise not to. And I already know that I say yes when you sneak into my room. <laughs> and um, so in Phoenix, I went to this dumpy little hotel, which was, um, I had someone else drive me there or something. Like I made sure like you're, you just stay away from me. And that was so awful that I found a, a woman's house to stay at the next night. And it just, it was good. <laughs> um, oh, but he did, he did somebody in Phoenix had some little trailer or something outside of their house. And I was really tired. So I went out there to sleep after a plane ride or something and I woke up and he was kneeling at the foot of my bed, you know, so I, I got up and I left and, you know, that's what happened in Phoenix. Um, and again, just, I was just so not okay as a human being. Um, He's got all these other, he had all these other wars he was fighting, wars 
meaning literally like he sees them as wars, like getting online with arguing with people. And he, I guess maybe some of that happened a little later. Um, so the, I guess the thing I really remember grappling with and thinking about um, was here was this man who I felt a lot of love for um, and I have more insight into myself now <laughs> about why I felt that love, um, which since I didn't have that insight then, I won't really talk about maybe until we get to the future when I start having those insights, if we get that far. Um, but my insight then was I, um, I felt like I needed to protect him because the movement depended on him. And if people found out the truth about him, then all of the things that I really care about that I know are good things, like LGBT rights and you know women's issues and all these things, which he supposedly represents, will be damaged and So it's like I had this huge weight on my shoulders that I didn't want. Um, and and it was like I was I was trying to think through the ethics of what I was doing in my head because it was completely because I'm a really honest person, right? And now I'm doing this incredibly dishonest thing and he's lying about it to all of these people and just bald-faced lies and I'm complicit with those lies because I know that they're lies and I don't like lying like that and if I say anything about this I don't know what's going to happen so like, I'm just stuck in this awful, awful place, um, morally and ethically. And then I don't even know what to say about my husband, because that's just such a different situation. And I look back on it now. I, so this is a, this is my net, my today insight, but I probably had this earlier, maybe 2014, but you know, I was always like, why doesn't my husband, why can't he see <laughs> that I'm in love with another man and that all of this is going on. And then I'm completely, why isn't he aware of that? And now I understand that well, it's because of the autism. Like, but he was just, he wouldn't know. Like he can't read social cues. He doesn't, he didn't, he's not aware of me at all ever. So anyway, so those are, those are the, that's my ethical dilemma in that time period. So I decide um, that I don't like the situation. And I'm like, John, you know what? You and I should just have sex. Cause at this time we haven't had intercourse and, um, he hasn't wanted to have intercourse and I'm starting to have questions about why he doesn't want to have intercourse. Cause you know, and I'm starting to wonder, is it that he doesn't want to have intercourse because he's, planning to repent and because in the mormon church if you don't have intercourse then you don't get excommunicated it's all like whether or not the penis goes in the vagina that's the whole big thing which makes no sense but um and i'm like well, what happened like this, this is getting scary like i'm in this really 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 scary situation so in march i'm like we should just have intercourse And um, so this is the only time in 
March when I was like, no, you're come to come to my hotel. I want you to come and we're going to have intercourse because this is stupid. What is this? And so he came and he could not get an erection when I was being forward. You know, the, the game was me saying no and him pursuing me to an extent. And as soon as that got switched, like it was different. <laughs> Something was wrong. And that, and then I became more suspicious at that point that, you know, he's just playing a game with me. <laughs> like he doesn't, you know, I, I'm starting to gain insight into the manipulation, what's going on. Like he's got the sexual game he's playing. <laughs> he's not having intercourse. He probably is not having intercourse for reasons. He publicizes his whole life online. Everything he does is let me tell you about myself and make a podcast about it. I'm like, this is the guy that everybody, he's so, he uses the, and I, I was having this insight into, you know, the psychology of vulnerability or whatever, where he's supposedly telling the whole world the truth about himself in order to get them to be like, Oh, we love you. And we'll donate to you. And, um, Anyway, so <coughs> that happened the first night while we were in Idaho. Um, in March. In March. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, the second night, we're supposed to sleep at a host's home. And this time I'm like, no, don't come into my room. And... Um, I was sleeping up in a, and, and as I've thought back about this, cause it's really, well, I'll, I'll tell the story first and I'll tell you my insights about it. But so I was like, no, don't come into the room. And I was sleeping in this children's bedroom in a twin size bed. The lights are off. And again, his hands are under my blankets, groping me. And this time, you know, I, I just push him off and I say, you know, go away. And, Um, I've posted about this on, so I guess I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there are people who would say that that was assault because I said, don't come to my room. And then he came to my room and he was groping me soon after I said, don't come into my room. But you know, as, as I look back, I'm like, well, what was the difference between that and what happened in Houston when I said, don't come to my room, and he came. Well, the difference is, in Houston, I consented, right? And in this, in March, I didn't consent. From his perspective, he's doing the same thing. He's coming to the room when he says, after I say no, and he's getting me to consent. You know, really what's changed here is me in not giving the consent. So I'm not here to talk about what the definition of assault is and is not, just These are the nuances. Um, so that occurred in um, March. Now I have another memory um, that's important because it was a crime. And I don't know when it was specifically, but it was in this time period, February to April somewhere. And I don't know when it was because I was at home. Um, so I can't date it in my mind. Um, but he, so we were working on these conferences. I said, are we working together on a daily basis running this 501c3 and, um, He, he started, and he was often at, you know, employer, employee, whatever, at this point, right? The, the boundaries while we're working, we were sometimes talking about work and we were sometimes not talking about work. You know, it wasn't like all work. So we were on Skype and um, he started asking me questions about last time I'd had sex. And, you know, actually... <laughs> To be frank, I'd never had sex at that point in time. I didn't even know what sex was. 
until I had um, really what I would consider sex for the first time, real intercourse with a, with a man later. Um, so I'm going to, I don't really, I don't want to talk about my husband's sexuality here. So I think I'll, I'm just going to leave that off because that's not something that needs to go on this record, but I had never had normal sexual intercourse. Let's just, and I'm 36 or seven years old. Um, I don't know how old I'm 44 now. I was probably older than that. We just have to do the math. So I, um, I, I, we started talking about masturbating and, um, he offered what a guy to listen to me masturbate. And I agreed. And I turned the camera up to the ceiling like this, right? You couldn't see anything. It's, and I, the camera was sitting on the bed, kind of like it is now up above. And I said to him, look, don't record this. Cause I know that he has a tendency to make recordings of people with the recorder in his pocket when he's not, he doesn't have, have, that's one, that's one of the things he does is he records people without them knowing. And then he puts their recordings out online to say, gotcha, doing this awful thing. I have proof, right? So that's one of the things he does. And I, just, I know that he does this because he tells me about it. And um, so I say, look, don't record it. And I went ahead and I masturbated. And he got, and a week later, he, um, comes to me and he tells me that he recorded it and he feels so guilty and he's been feeling so dark. And I of course was just horrified. You know, I'd never, I'd never done anything like that before in my life. I've never done anything like that since in my life. I was convinced to do that then I told him not to record it. And then he did. And, um, and then I guess he listened to it because he was confessing that he was listening. Like, I don't know. And this, this, this comes to a point in which I'm like, look, I don't know what this guy was doing or trying to do and all the different ways he was trying to mess with me, but he's clearly messing with me. Um, and um, so I was like, I, I um, told him to throw it away. I was like, get rid of that right now. I heard the trash go. I was like, did you empty the trash? Um, I don't know. I can't trust anything he says or does, so who knows. But it was very, very upsetting to me. Um, and again, I can't date that, but somewhere in that time period. Um, and then in April, we had a conference in Boston. So this time he came to my town and, you know, he's just always trying to get time alone with me. We went dancing. He asked me to, I don't know go somewhere with him and I just went home to my house um, and yeah, I don't really have not really much to say about that um, but in June The 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 problem or the good thing or the I don't know was that what I was doing was being very very successful because we had all these conferences going um, donations were increasing we my plan 
which I had developed after spending years watching Mormons and the way they socially interact, have, trying to create safe conferences where you could have ex-Mormons who don't believe and Mormons who do believe in the same room was really working. And all of a sudden we had very, very important Mormons starting to agree to come keynote at our conferences, the ones who wouldn't ever before associate with lowly, so to speak, evil ex-Mormons were now, wow, I'll keynote. So um, it was time for the June conference in Salt Lake City and we were able to get Claudia Bushman, who's Richard Bushman's wife. And I don't know if you know who these people are, but they're important people in Mormonism. Over the summer, we were getting a man named Clayton Christensen, who is uh, a very important Mormon in the Boston area, was, talk was ag about to agree to keynote at a New York City conference. And like this hadn't, ever, this hadn't happened before in Mormonism, where people were willing to maybe say, wow, I feel safe associating with the other side and maybe we're not all going to be excommunicated or whatever if we associate with the other side. So it was like, I'm feeling like, wow, I've got the weight of all of this on my shoulders because this is really successful what I've done. And then I've got the weight of this on my shoulders. And I'm really at this point, not in an okay place personally, of course. Um, oh, and somewhere around the same time, which also can be dated with public record, um, some apologists, said that they were going to release a hit piece all about John Miller of like 150 pages and apologists are just, anyway, Matt knows what those are. So, and he knows. That. So John of course was worried that the hit piece might have information about the two of us in it or something. I don't know. Maybe he's worried about all sorts of other things he's done. I have no idea what he's really done. I don't know how they, that people writing hit piece would have information about the two of us. Cause I don't know, but clearly since he was doing this, maybe he had real reason to be worried about what was going to be in that hit piece. So he worked to quash, squelch, whatever the hit piece by writing important Mormon authorities and saying, look, if you, if you allow this hit piece to be published, then all of these people who depend on me are going to be hurt along with me. I mean, he was just constantly playing this dishonest, anyway I don't need to go into it. I don't need to go into that because other people can analyze that for themselves it's information they can decide about but, but I of course was like whoa you know what if I am in the hit piece what is going to happen here like so <coughs> in There's another conference in June of 2012 now in Salt Lake City. So and two June conferences in Salt Lake or just one? Just one. So if I, if I mentioned that earlier, I'm now talking about the same one. Okay. That's my memory um, as I go back and forth between the images in my mind. But so at, at this conference, Oh, and also the board has now decided that they're going to make my pay equal to John's because I'm doing the work. So he was getting $5,000 a month and I, I'm getting $5,000 a month too. I'm like, wow, I can really use that money too. I need this money. <laughs> um, and there was also talk about making me the executive director. And I'm mixing up memories. I apologize. Um, so this is going on, I guess, probably before the June conference. Maybe that's why I'm saying, I'm, again, it's hard for me to date anything that's not related to a conference itself. But I fly into the June conference this time, and he was just being very, very cruel, just mean. He's insulting me. Um, it's treating me really badly and 
this is the this is the part where I look back on my memory that I just I don't like about myself. Um, when um, he treated me that way, I agreed to be sexual with him, and. After I did, he was nice to me again. And all of a sudden I'd gone from this really angry, awful John to this really, okay, this is nice, cool, everything's happy again, John. And, you know, just my, my, my insight about myself after all of this has gone on, I, I mean, I, I guess I have lots of things I could say about myself as to why I did that. And, you know, one of one of them is well, yeah. When somebody's being awful to you, you can make it better um, by being sexual. But that's I don't. That's that's just awful. It's the whole thing. I mean, I just I was <sighs> yeah. This is bad. So, but then we went up to this. Um retreat, I guess, in somebody's house in Park City. And again, he starts chasing me around the house while other people are around. He's like trying to get caught again. It's this fun game. And so, and he'd like, I'd tell him to stop and he'd have his hand on my breast. And then, you know, but, but it wasn't that I wasn't consenting again too. Like I wasn't consenting during that part of it, but early, like the night before I had, I remember touching his penis. I did that. Right. So, um, anyway, I'm just messed up. I think at this point, I'm just not okay in any way anymore. And there's the hit piece and the conferences are being successful. And Clayton Christensen is maybe going to come out to one of our conferences and I've got a raise <laughs> and you know, so that's, and oh, in the, in the midst of this, while all of these other conferences were going on, I was also working with the LGBT Mormon community, um, doing some, or making some more circling the wagons conferences, which I didn't bring up because John didn't fly to those. So I'd also been to Washington DC, I think in March doing a circling the wagons conference, um, which was all my thing. <coughs> and um, this just, I guess I don't really have, <sighs> over the summer, after the June conference, I flew back home, there was just this awful period of, okay, well, what are we going to do? Because I'm not okay. <laughs> I'm now being sort of maybe offered the executive director job, but I didn't ever di dare sign that contract. I'm not really sure what's going on. One day, John, John would be like, no, I want you to take the executive director job. I'm just going to disappear. And then the next day he'd be like, no, you need to get out of here. And, you know, kind of the back and forth on all these different things. And then he was also, I mean, I don't really know what he was doing. I think he was just playing a lot of games with a lot of people. He got some donors involved and he started like saying bad things about me to the donors and he was trying to convince the donors to go against me and he was talking about how we don't have any performance review and of course I've been a stay-at-home mom right I don't know the work world I I'm figuring things out as I go this clearly isn't the work world this is a completely effed up situation and um, anyway, this is this is the conversation that's going on, and the the donors, the, and then we're talking like some big donors here. Um, I think one of them in particular was very astute. He's like, Anne runs this organization. If we get rid of Anne, what do we have left? Um, and was trying to find a. And I don't really know what the donors knew because I don't know what John was really telling people because John was constantly manipulating everybody to try and get people to do things. Like, I don't know. I, I know how messed up I was and how I wanted to keep my job and how I 
didn't know what was going to happen and how I also um, knew that John really wanted um, um, he really wanted to have an honorable September 6th excommunication and my my awareness of this goes back just knowing John very well, but several months to the August 2011 conference where we had, um, he'd done a podcast interview of Quinn, who was one of the September 6th, who had gotten this honorable excommunication, except John had mentioned maybe there was this little dishonorable part to, about it because it had become known that Quinn had had maybe some sort of homosexual affair with someone before he got excommunicated. So was it really an honorable excommunication or was it, um, you know, a little bit dishonorable because it was maybe about the sex thing, right? So, and he wanted to have his September 6th excommunication. So all this is happening. I'm like, he needs to repent. Something like, if he can't repent, then he can't get his September 6th excommunication. I mean, I, I know that his repentance at this point isn't real because I've now dealt with him long enough that real repentance and John, like, what is that? He's just manipulating people. He's lying but he needs to publicly repent. Or he, and so I'm worried about that. <laughs> like, how do I get out of here? There's no way out for me. <laughs> because he's got to go on with telling his life story and putting together his... People who know him will understand what I'm saying. I don't need to go into that because it's obvious you just watch him. Um, but for me, you know, I'm just, yeah, I'm just the one that did the work and uh, there's no way out and I'm just messed up. And, um, I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. Like, you know, one day I wanted to leave, but then I'm like, well, if I leave, then what happens? If I stay, then what happens? There's nothing here that can happen. that's <laughs> going to be Okay. For me, there's no, you know, but I, I just was like, what, what's the safe way out for me? And, you know, the safe way out for me is John knocks it off. We start being professional. We find a way to separate us in the business if some way, if something needs to happen. He can go work on his PhD. He can do whatever he wants. He can do his podcast. And I just run this side of the business conference aside that's that's the only safe way out for me I can think of because me leaving is not safe because I don't know what he's going to podcast next and he's so um so we're, we're just trying to figure he and I are trying to figure out what to do he and I but in reality there's just all these manipulations going on and um there is a <clears throat> um, he at the end of this period somewhere he was like nope you're leaving that's what's going to happen and I love you, yada, yada. I love you more than anyone I've ever loved my whole life, whatever I want you to know. I mean, I actually was saying that kind of stuff the whole time. I guess if I could go back in, if I go back into his verbal, he just says a lot of shit, frankly. Um, but, um, so he, I was at a Circling the Wagons conference now, again, easier to date, in San Francisco. And he's not there because it's Circling the Wagons, and Circling the Wagons is the project that I've done all without him, pretty much. And it's while I'm at that conference that he's like, nope, you have to leave no matter what. And I'm going to call Joanna Brooks, who's the board president and also lives in California, and tell her that I'm in love with you. And because I'm in love with you, I can't work with you anymore. 
and this is never going to work. And when, because we're in love with each other, you know, we can't work together. So I'm, and then while I'm running the conference, he changes the password. So I can't get onto the, to print out whatever I need. Like I don't have access to the things I need to do to run the conference while I'm running the conference. I'm getting texts from him about how I'm losing my job and I have to leave the board members about to come up and he's told her the quote story and it was just an awful experience. I was like, I, I remember sitting on the front pew at the conference, just crying. And the person I'm working with, who was helping me with circling the wagons, just like, look at me, what is wrong? And Carolyn Pearson sees me crying and she's like, puts her arm around me. She's what's wrong. Anne? and I have memories of like, just being in the stall in the bathroom, just crying. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm in this awful situation. This man's got to get his stupid honorable excommunication and I'm, I have to leave, but it's not going to be safe for me to leave. Like, there's nothing safe. Um, so Joanna comes and we have a conversation about how, based on John's information about how we're in love with each other. So we can't work together. And, um, Um, and I leave San Francisco and that, that it's funny that my plane ride home I had my first alcohol because you know, Mormons don't drink alcohol and I, I had it on an airplane <laughs> not really knowing that it would be more powerful on an airplane so it's kind of like a I don't know a moment for me that was really positive just I'm just gonna try and wash this away and move forward in my life but that's a fun memory, but, um, so when I got back home and I was still stuck with, yeah, but this is not safe. Like this guy's going to publicly repent. He's something's going to happen here. Like there's nothing good for me. And so I, I texted Joanna and I was like, look, this is what's really been going on. You know, I'm reporting to you what's been going on. Um, which, of course, for Joanna was this huge shock because remember, John's telling the whole world that he's a family guy. Like this is, he's, he writes Mormon authorities to tell them that he's temple worthy and sexually pure or whatever. Like anyone who has the gall to do that talk about their own sexual purity while they're writing those kinds of public letters and distributing them couldn't possibly actually be doing this kind of stuff. Right. So she's shocked. Um, but <coughs> she didn't do anything to help protect me. Instead, she worked with John to cover it up because we needed to protect John. Cause now she was in the same position that I was in. You know, if I look back at when I was talking about, my confused feelings in February, March, April, whatever. It's like, I'm like, well, this is going on, but I quote, love him. And so I have to protect him because if I don't protect him, then all of this movement that I care about and that I love and all these, you know, the LGBT people and the women's needs and all these needs that really need to be taken care of that are being neglected by the Mormon church is, are sitting on the, honor of this man right who's a horribly dishonorable man and so now i pass that on to her and I, you know i don't i'm not going to try it tell anyone what's going on in her head i don't know but i know what happened and what happened was that instead of getting help which i needed um she went and got an attorney and um, <coughs> um, and I, I and I got this email that basically said, "Because you are both equally responsible," or it doesn't say that actually. You can look at the email. Matt has a copy of it, but it was basically a really 
bad legal solution to the situation, which is we were both supposed to resign, which I now understand if I had resigned, then I wouldn't have had any protection through a sexual harassment claim because you lose your, if you willingly resign, then you lose that um, protection. And then John was, he wanted 100% of all donations. So now I've built up all of this. I've built this beautiful business that has these donations coming in, right? Another thing that's going on is that now I'm getting equal pay with him. He doesn't want to share equal pay because he really cares about money. So if I'm really taking equal pay, he'd rather just have me gone and he wants the conferences gone because he wants the money. And so in this email, you know, it's better to look at the emails and analyze the written record from that. And I can talk to Matt about it or he can figure it out. He's an attorney. I mean, but we were supposed to resign and then we were supposed to reapply. And I already knew that if I resigned and I reapplied, I wasn't going to get my job back because John was trying to get rid of me, right? So John resigned and reapplied and I refused to resign so I wouldn't lose my legal status, forcing them to terminate me. And so they did. And um, the rest of the board didn't know what was going on because Joanna was the only person that I had reported to as the president of the board. And I'm still not safe. Um, Cause I don't know what's going to happen with his future repentance and September 6th excommunication that he needs to get. Um, and also I, at this point prior to my termination, I got banned from all of the Facebook groups. I was just like, get rid of Anne, silence Anne. And now they're terminating me and they're covering it up. And so they, um, they, they sent an email, Joanna sent an email through to the rest of the board that had no idea what was going on, talking about how I was moving on or something. Just read the email. I can't remember. I haven't read it in years. I was moving on to other projects and they were going to change all of the found the 501c3 so that it was only going to be a podcast, get rid of the conferences and <coughs> um, John was reapplying for his position as part of that. And he was going to come on as a 1099 contractor instead of a W2 employee, which at this point I think probably has something to do with um, ownership of the intellectual property rights that, he may be trying to work something else. It would be, it'll be, it would be IRS compliant for him to have joint ownership. It's a legal issue. Um, so my response to that was, well, I need to let the board know what's really going on. So I timed it kind of guessing their timing from my computer. And at this, at this point, I'm just terrified. Like, Yeah, I'm just terrified. Um. Anyway, <coughs> hoping the board will offer me some sort of protection or something. Um. So I. They, Joanna sends the email through with the cover up and John's reapplication to take 100% of donations so he gets all the money. And at the same time, I called every single board member and said, look, sexual harassment, I don't really get everything that's going on. I don't want to talk about it all, but this is, you know, there's just a lot more going on and the conversations were just short. And then of course the board was in shock because everybody thought John was what he was telling the public that he was. And, um, you know, from there, I just, I, I don't know what was really going on. Nobody, they immediately, the first thing the board did is they reversed my termination and then they dropped both me and John from the board of directors. 
together. And I was really hoping after I reported to the board that somebody would let me come to the board and talk to the board about what was, about what was going on. You know, that, to me, that's what made sense. I'm like, look, I've got all this information about the business and everything that's been happening. And I'd like to talk to you. I didn't want necessarily to talk about the sexual things, but I, I wanted to just have an opportunity to address the board about the business at least. But I just immediately got dropped from the board. They went quiet. And um, I got like one phone call where they were asking about the business. And in that phone call, um, one, of the, one of the board members that was I, trying to figure out what's going on slipped to me that um, they'd even, they tried to get the first attorney to help them with this termination of me. And the first attorney that they asked said no, because it wasn't ethical. So they had to go find another attorney. Um, and then, I don't know, I, She realized she wasn't supposed to say that. Somebody told her to be quiet. Like they're trying to keep information from me. Um, But what I managed to do with the board, which I felt like was at least some protection for myself and would not make me have to completely disappear from Mormonism um, altogether and just be able to continue with my work, whatever work was, I, I managed to convince the board to allow me to keep the circling the wagons project. Because John, in wanting to completely silence me, I mean, he was even telling people, like, the rule is Anne doesn't ever get to come to a Sunstone conference. Like, Anne has to disappear. And so we're going to give, and Sunstone was a competing organization. We're going to gift. I don't want to do circling the wagons because it was never my project. And, but I don't want Anne to have circling the wagons because if Anne takes circling the wagons, then she will still have a voice. <laughs> I don't want Anne to have a voice. So he tried to gift circling the wagons off to Sunstone to completely silence me and get rid of me. And he got Joanna to help him with that. And so what I managed to do after I told the board what was going on was get them to get me circling the wagons so that I could continue on with another organization doing at least some of the work that had been very meaningful to me and keep my voice. So that was good. And after I, um, they, they, they were trying to be, quote, professional, just as a small organization in trauma. And so they asked me if I wanted an investigation about the sexual harassment. And I said, no. And I put it in writing. Like, I, I'm terrified. I don't want to talk about this. I don't know what John's telling you. John, at this point, is pulling out texts where I messed up, which, you know, proving that it was consensual and it was an affair. And at this point, I was calling it an affair. Like, I hadn't... I'd had all of this experience, but I hadn't had the insight into what had really happened there that I have now. Now I don't look at it. I'm like, well, there's, this was a lot of really messed up things. And there was maybe a part of it that was like an affair at the beginning of it. This was just really messed up. But I, I was using that word then. And John was taking advantage of that and (sighs) being him. And I was just kind of like trying to be quiet and be safe and, um, so I got Circling the Wagons and I managed to pull off a really, really successful Circling the Wagons conference in November, just a couple months later. And <coughs> I was trying to be resilient. Um, and one of the, I guess, an important thing that occurred um, was when I, when they asked me to resign the second time, and this time I had gotten circling the wagons and I agreed to resign. I think one month of severance or something small had been offered me, but they wanted, they they told me that if I, I could have the rest of my severance, like maybe I had 13 days left or something. And this might not be exactly right. It's probably better to look at the written record, but I would get a small amount of money for signing an NDA. But they weren't giving me any information about John signing the NDA too. And my, my fear is he's got this big false repentance coming because he wants his September 6 X communication so that he can get his honor for helping women and LGBT people. Well, LGBT, well, I'm the one that was doing the LGBT conferences. Like he's not, he's not anyway. So I was like, I can't sign an NDA if he's not going to sign an NDA. I mean, of course what I want is to have this be professional 
and have this not be talked about so I can just go on with my life in a positive way. Um, it's like, what, what woman ever wants to be giving this interview? <laughs> right? So, but it was like, well, I can't sign the NDA because nobody's getting him to sign one. And that's just weird. Like you, you settle and then everybody signs the, the, the agreements. You don't try and trick one party into signing, which is what was, they were doing. Um, so that occurred and I went on and I did the conference in November, 2000, November, 2012. And again, it was, it was actually an amazing, um, success in some ways after more difficulties in Mormonism, another public figure, an LGBT public figure at this point complained about my keynote selection because again I was still trying to do the same thing so I got it for my November 2012 conference I got um an LGBT blogger who was married to a woman to keynote assign aside two LGBT bloggers who were in relationships with men or wanted to be in relationships with men and the point was we disagree but we can all sit in the same room and that's what needs to happen for some healing and for some discussions to occur between both sides. And so, but anyway, there was a big controversy over that, that I had to deal with a huge public controversy on top of everything, but I made it through all of that. Like this was awful. It was terminated. I lost my income, but I was still doing the work I wanted to do. I made it through some more traumatic things that had to do with all the publicity we were getting and I was trying to be hopeful that John would calm down and that he'd reverse some of his retaliations so that I wouldn't be banned from all of the Facebook groups that I was banned from. Cause it was very embarrassing. Like I disappear and then I'm banned from everything. And if, at the time I was just mortified, humiliated. Um, and probably feeling more humiliated than I needed to feel because most likely people didn't really notice, but I noticed that I was, publicly I he put out this public statement that um that about covering up why the conferences were going away you know and I wasn't even mentioned my name was removed from the website because his whole job was I was gonna his whole idea was I was gonna disappear um so that was good I, I don't think I went I don't think I took any classes that semester because I was still trying to finish my degree. Maybe because of everything that was going on with this, I didn't take any classes that semester. But um, the next semester, I took, I, signed, I was signed up for a, a class, getting back into my degree, degree, put my life back together, and out comes his fake repentance podcast, where he's gone back to the church. And in that podcast, Matt had his experiences with that podcast as well. Um, he, I don't know, I don't know what, if he made a deal with the church or whatever for him to publicly repent, because he, I guess it's just better. But he, he, <coughs> he had been what he had been doing was being a voice for all of these um, Mormons who didn't believe in the church anymore and who were going to, who are facing the fact that if you don't believe in Mormonism, your family thinks that you're evil and you get kicked out of your family. So you can, that can happen because you're LGBT. It can, happened because you don't believe in Mormonism. I mean, so he had been the voice for all these people who were the people who were donating to our communities, who were part of the communities, who after what happened at Planet Hollywood in New York City, we pulled into the communities to give them voice and power and community, right? That's what we were doing. That was the whole point of the project. And that's, the donations had come in. And of course, there were fights over the summer because I was like, look, the donations are 
when we, we, business arguments, which I haven't gotten into in this, but no, no, we're, not everybody's always donating for your podcast. Some of the donations are coming because of the communities. Like you don't own all the money, but he's like, no, the money's all mine because I'm the public figure. And if I didn't exist, then none of this would happen because it's all about me. I mean, that's just his reasoning. It's the way he sees the world. So I think that's pretty apparent to anybody who knows him and is watching this. So I don't really need to get into that here, but, um, <coughs> but I, as soon as this fake repub- fake repentance podcast came out, knew that it was pretty apparent to a lot of people that something else was going on here and that it, w- it was pointing straight at me. And he was, and it, I don't know what, I mean, like, I don't know. I started getting phone calls and I don't know what percentage of people would have had that insight because he didn't use my name in the podcast, but he said enough. So now, I mean, his objective was, if we think through this, I'm terminated. I'm completely under the rug. He would have liked me to have an NDA so that he could say whatever he wanted. And now he's podcasting about it and he's changing his his story about, or who he is, he's gone from, a, I'm, I'm out to help the Mormons who don't believe to, I'm actually going to believe in the church again. And I'm on the church's side for a little while. And on top of that, he called out people in our communities for smoking weed and swinging publicly on the podcast so that they, you know, we, they had come to us so that they could be safe and have community and now he turned their back on all of them so that he could repent so that as I knew he could get his September 6 X communication and get hailed because he wanted the, he wanted the honor, the public honor of being like these people who'd been excommunicated honorably before him. And it didn't matter to him whether he was throwing me under the bus or everybody in the communities under the bus. I mean, it was never about that for him. So I, I left school. I was completely, I started having anxiety attacks. I was terrified. Oh, and I can't date it again. I don't know if this happened during the fall after I was terminated and I was banned from everything or right after the podcast, but I tend to be a very resilient person. Um, I've been through a lot in my life and I just keep making it. Um, But the public shame of what was happening to me was just awful. I didn't know what to do. And I have this memory of like wanting to cut my skin. Like the pain was so awful. I wanted to cut to get rid of the pain. I've never felt anything like that before. And it was just about, you just being so silenced. Like I didn't know who I could go to, who I could talk to. There was nobody to help because everybody protects John <laughs> because he's dangerous. I mean, so anyway, it's just a, I guess I'm saying that because I know a lot of people deal with suicidality all of the time. And despite many, many things that are awful that happened to me, I just haven't had that experience. And I, it's even for the brief time that I had that experience, I was terrifying. I, I can't imagine what it's like for people who feel that all the time. I, it was hor- horrible. So anyway, after the podcast came out, and I think I was dealing with some suicidality right after that too, but not like the, I feel like cutting my skin. That was, wow. that was weird. <laughs> Terrible. But, um, so, and then, yeah, the anxiety attacks too. I was like, I just like, my, I start sweating and my heart is pounding and I don't know what's going on. And so it's like, I think this is related to, I just need power. Like I have no power in this situation. So I was like, I'm going to get an attorney <laughs> and, um, which was really terrifying. And I think, I think the terror of it goes back to, you know, as I was talking about the 
time in June, 2012, when he'd been really mean to me and then I was sexual with him, right? I think there's something about when you're in a really dangerous situation, it's scary to be powerful because then the person might be hurt you more just because you do something to stand up to them. You're going to get retaliated against more. And so I, I think that there's something that plays into that with the me being sexual and this time when I'm being treated poorly, but um, you know, it was that it was terrifying to go get an attorney. So I'm like, if I stand up to him in any way, then what's he going to do? Like, it gets worse when you stand up to someone. Uh, but I went and got the attorney and I, I went to the attorney. I was like, look, and it's still at this point, I was feeling guilty. <laughs> I look back on it now. I'm like, wow, I have so much more insight about myself now. I've been through so much. I don't feel guilty about any of this. I mean, I, I know so much more about myself and the world, but I also didn't want to, I was so protective of him. Even after all of this, I was, I, I was like, look, I just need a chart. <laughs> I'm trying to be as gentle as possible. I don't want this to go public. And of course, for my own protection, I didn't want it. I didn't ever want to be giving this interview. Right. I just wanted this to be over. Um, so I said to my attorneys to make, make a gentle charge and then it'll be on the records because got to have some documents. And I, I remember having the insight then that the most important thing I could do for me to have some sort of power was to start creating a paper trail. Whatever that paper trail was, there had to be a paper trail because without a paper trail, it was just me versus him. And I was, I had so little power in comparison to him that, that I guess the right way to put it is that I wasn't okay. Like I was having anxiety attacks. I was feeling suicidal. I was so powerless and so desperate with nobody helping me that I needed something. And sure enough, as soon as I got the attorney, you know what? I was like, okay, things aren't better, but I feel better. Like, I'm not just under his feet. He can't just do anything he wants. He can't just say anything he wants to the public. He can't just go out and do this stupid repentance thing that is not real. Because he pretends to himself that it's real in some way, or he convinces himself that, or he's manipulating his wife, or manipulating, I don't know how many people are manipulating himself, I don't care, I guess his psyche doesn't matter. <laughs> but he can't just do whatever he wants, I'm going to create a paper trail too. <laughs> so I got the, I got the attorney in, um, I had, I had talked to a couple attorneys in Utah while the Open Stories Foundation had their attorney to get rid of me about, you know, what my rights would be. And it was just like, you have no rights because you don't have 15 employees. So if the Open Stories Foundation had enough employees, then you'd have some rights and we could talk. But since you don't have any rights, like, you're out. <laughs> but in New Hampshire, where I had lived, um, while this was, while I was employed, and since I'd been working from my computer a lot of the time, I only needed six employees. And there were six employees of the Open Stories Foundation. So on the last day of the statute of limitations in New Hampshire under, you know, the discrimination laws, I got the charge in or second last day or something. And it just sat there and this forced the open stories foundation, John, basically to um, write a response and send it in. And I skipped something that was important. I um in In the fall, while I was still more resilient before the podcast came out and managing it and possibly having some suicidal feelings at times that were weird, um, I, had, I was still terrified because I was terrified that John was going to do what he did. I was terrified for a good reason. I was predicting him very well. Um, and so, and I was still banned and I would like written, I was like, I'd written and I was like, look, you guys need to unban me. You need to treat me professionally. This is, this is dumb. And I'd written to John and his wife at this point so that I could be respectful saying, look, stop retaliating or whatever. And we need to have a talk about this because I don't think this publicity plan is a good idea. Like, and when I sent that letter through, 
And then the entire board resigned, except for one person who stayed and she sent an email through that wasn't an accurate description of what had happened from my perspective. I was like, well, what bunch of drama and I don't know, I don't have energy for this. So that had occurred. And I just bring that up now because now when the OSF is responding, it's no longer the OSF board that's responding. It's John and this one board member who had been with the board. Well, it happened named Natasha Helfer, Helfer Parker, who is still with him now. And she's the one person who's stuck through everything. And actually, well, there's more. She, I don't know if that's important or not, but. So. So, yeah, so he, he had to respond to my charge and he had a deadline. And he had an attorney in Utah. And of course the charge is through New Hampshire. And he wrote up this response to the charge that would just be humiliating to me if anybody saw it publicly. Like he took some of the texts and things from when I was just the most messed up, which I was, I wonder why. <laughs> and um, just made me look awful. And then instead of emailing it or instead of returning it to the human rights commission, like he was supposed to, he emailed it to my attorney and he said, let's settle or something. The emails are there. We can look and see. And um, my attorney's response to that was he thinks that the chart, that if he sends it to the human rights commission, that it's going to become a public document because in Utah, where his attorney is from, it would have been a public document. He doesn't know that in New Hampshire, that it's private. So he's not creating, he, what he's trying to do is the same thing that he's been doing all along, which is terrify you and shame you. And with, with creating this public record. So don't let him treat you this way. And he just wrote back and said, no, just turn it into the New Hampshire Human Rights Commission. So his document went there. And it wasn't public anyway, but, you know, it, it kind of goes, as I think through patterns and I'm going back at whatever, you know, like when he recorded me having the orgasm. He needed to tell me about that a week later to shame me. I mean, there was just the whole, the whole thing was this sexual power control thing, you know, I, so the story goes on. I, that all happened around the same time that I know I, I went, I was like, I got to figure out how to get out of my relationship with my husband because this is really bad. And, you know, in a lot of ways that's, that's the source of a lot of this misery in my life. We can go on for that. So I went and got a therapist. I was like, you've got to help me figure out how to get out of this relationship with my, I can't figure out why I can't figure out how to divorce him. And the therapist listened for a while and she was like, I think you might have autism. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she said, she, of course, said, look, I can't diagnose your husband. You know that. I know that. That's not how it works. Of course, I'm getting a degree in clinical psychology. She's like, I've never seen him. But I think you should go do some research online about it. So I went and did some research. And all of a sudden, just my whole life starts falling together. Um, and after I started figuring out autism and interactional patterns with autism, I started piecing pieces together with my husband and start, figured out how to begin the divorce process. But that was in 2013. And like I said, I'm still in court with the guy. Like autism is so hard to divorce in some cases. And it's very common for women to do just what I did or men. If the, if the woman's on the spectrum is just not recognized as much to just stay for the kids. So, I don't know, that's kind of the end of the John DeLynn story that people don't know about that Matt needs. I'm trying to think of, oh, I guess I should go, I should finish with the story about excommunication and the legal stuff. And that's probably what he needs. Um, so, So I was working on my divorce, 
trying to figure out how that goes, how that would work very hard. Um, in the summer of 2014. Yeah. So he would have put the fake repentance podcast, which is what I call it in early 2013. Okay. And then he would have been going back to his normal self, which is not a repentant Mormon. Like he was pretending to be at that moment in time, but, uh, uh, a Mormon who wanted to be a hero for women's and LGBT issues and things. Um, and by 2014, the church was threatening to excommunicate him, which is what he wanted. So he, um, but of course, he's also not telling the public that's what he wanted. He's telling, he's a martyr. And I'm not trying to say he wouldn't have conflicting feelings. One thing that's true about John is he's got conflicting feelings in all directions at all times. So I'm not trying to claim for anyone who may listen to this that he didn't, that he 100% of him wanted to be excommunicated. Some part of him wanted to be excommunicated. Some part of him didn't. I don't care. It's not my job to analyze him. This is just what I know. Um, but in the summer of 2014, sure enough, the excommunications are coming out. He is pairing himself with a women's right activist, Kate Kelly, and she's pairing himself with him, who um, who is also being threatened by the church for excommunication for trying to help women become ordained. And it happened at the same time, made it look more like September 6th, because that would have demonstrated to the public that it was a church coordinated excommunication, because the Mormon church is always trying to claim that um, the excommunications are local decisions. So sure enough, the article that comes out in the newspaper that Larry Goodstein publishes the third paragraph down or something, it's talking about the September 6th, you know, and from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, cause he needed to call Laurie Goodstein. Of course, I don't know what happened for sure, but he needed to call Laurie Goodstein and tell her about the September 6th because he needs his honorable September 6th excommunication, which is what he's needed all the time or what he's wanted all along. And, you know, and I'm of course, yeah. So anyway, I wrote Kate Kelly. And I said, look, I know that he says he's being excommunicated for women's issues. You represent women's issues. This is not a women's issues, man. Like, but Kate Kelly didn't believe me. <laughs> um, and so she just ignored me. I was like, well, I guess I tried to warn. I saw her at a, I was part of a, I became part of another organization called Mormons Building Bridges with my LGBT work. And I saw Kate Kelly at a Sunstone conference. Oh, that's something else that happened that summer. So his excommunication was being published, published or publicized. And I think the New York Times article came out before the Sunstone conference, but because of all this publicity he was getting for his honorable excommunication for what he said, women's rights and LGBT rights, he was supposed to be one of the main speakers at a Sunstone conference. Well, I was working with another organization called Mormons Building Bridges at the time, and we were supposed to be presenting um, a workshop. And of course, one of his things had been, and can't come to a Sunstone conference. And all on, he was, he was doing this. Um, I can't ever be in the same room with Anne again because I'm in love with her. I'm attracted to her, or, or we had this affair, or whatever it is. And my wife won't let me. And, and of course he's publishing this. Like he's now, he's now even at some point, selling workshops on it, talking about how his failed relationship um, or how he and his wife put their relationship back together after his, while he was going through his quote faith crisis, he had this temptation. Anyway, he, he talks about this on his podcast. I and mean, I would just like to point out that his real faith crisis happened in 2001 or something. And he's supposed to be a leader at this point, And he's using his quote faith crisis as his excuse for, being sexual with me and I don't know who else. I mean, I don't know. I don't know anything he says is true or not, but 
or was I? Oh, so the Sunstone Conference, he pulls out of the keynote because I'm going to be there and makes this big hullabaloo about it. And, and of course, I'm getting, I'm getting tougher at this point. I'm like, well, because that would have been extra, extraordinarily shameful to me in 2012 to have him pretty much people know all the reasons why he's not there is because I'm there. Like I just wanted this to go away and have us be professional. But now I have to deal with the fact that I'm showing up, you know, here's my face. I'm here and I'm not going to just back away because he's going to do this. And of course, Sunstone wasn't going to, they couldn't very well kick me out in order to keep their keynote. So whatever he was, yeah, I can't remember. Anyway, so that happened. And it was, and one of my memories is um, a lot of people just ignored it. Some people didn't know. Um, one woman came up and just made a point of, uh, someone from Feminist Mormon Housewives made up and made a point of just shaking my hand and trying to be respectful to me. Because it was a really shameful kind of in some ways. Like I was like kind of being shamed because I was there. I just remember how shaky I felt. Um, like I guess I'm not sure if I liked that or not. I'm not sure that I liked her coming up trying to just kind of say, yeah, you're still, you're still a respectful person because kind of the fact that she had to say that was disrespectful. Um, but it was still a nice gesture. I remember I, I saw Kate Kelly there and I'd already told Kate Kelly that John wasn't who he was pretending to be. And she, I remember her kind of standing back in this hallway, almost like she was maybe wanted me to come talk to her. She was kind of looking at me, but she didn't come out. And, at this point, she didn't come out and talk to me and ask me any questions like she cared. It was like, look, if you want information, I've already told you, come get it. I, I don't know. So, so then, um, <laughs> um, my, Um, he, they go on publishing, publicizing their excommunications and how the church is victimizing them. And my ex-husband files fault on the divorce using, he's, now this is actually quite common for people with autism because they really will feel like they're abused when they're not being abused. But he, he filed fault um, accusing me of child abuse and spouse abuse and having an affair, John DeLynn, but he didn't put John's name on it so that John wouldn't be called to defend himself. And what he did was he, he refused his, his idea was I didn't get the kids and I didn't get any money. <laughs> this is autism. And I just had to leave. Of course, I wasn't going to do that because I knew I needed to stand up for my children and, you know, I was just trying to manage. So we went to mediation and since I wouldn't agree for, to just leave, right, then at the end of the mediation, my, his attorney called my attorney and said, if you don't do what he says, he's filing fault. And really what he was doing was he was using the fault and the publicity threat of John DeLynn while all of the publicity is going on in the church for John Dillon's excommunication to try and get me to give him more money and the kids. So it was kind of, it was an extortion type situation using him knowing that I was trying to keep things quiet and it worked. Ultimately I decided after 21 year marriage to give him three years of, to take three years of alimony only instead of trying to go to court and talk about all of this in court. So I agreed to that. So I was like, look, I have a lot of skills. If you just give me three years, I'll figure it out. Have all your stupid money. <laughs> he makes like $200,000 a little less than that. So while John's off getting everybody to feel bad for him because he needs his excommunication, I'm managing my ex-husband using John Lynn to get more money in the divorce whatever. So I finally ended up getting divorce documents, real ones. It was so great <laughs> in the summer of 2015. 
Um, but then I only had three years to um, figure out how to support my family. And I hadn't finished my degree. I did, that was mostly because my thesis took forever. I, and that was Harvard's issue. But, and I was really stressed out about a lot of things. But then, so I decided that since I needed to be able to support the kids by myself, and I didn't really have, I didn't have a great boss that could give me a good recommendation or anything, right? I didn't have this great history of this work history. I just had me and my skills. And I was able to get a, um, some money. <laughs> it's pretty hard. My husband actually spent $90,000 on credit cards during the divorce. Anyway. So I decided that I would buy a franchise because if I just had somebody to support me, I knew I could work hard and I could um, run a business. Because I have skills, I just need help because I don't have enough life experience in the right ways. So I did a lot of searching. I found a franchise I thought I wanted to do. I signed a franchise agreement and I... Um, Immediately after I signed the franchise agreement, I started getting all these kind of emails, narcissistic type emails that were really controlling the power. I was like, oh boy, who are these people I signed the contract with? This is scary. I um, flew down to my training in Texas and found out that they were, and that's not really important to what Matt's doing here, so I'll keep it brief, but they were running outbound phone calls into businesses across the United States and world while they were recording the phone calls um, and then putting all the data and asking people in businesses important questions about their business and their personal lives and putting data into databases and selling it. And because everything I knew that the, at this point, John's crime against me and how all of the wiretapping work, I knew that that was a crime. And so I was like witnessing them committing a crime and I knew the laws and I immediately was like, nope, I know the laws. I'm not gonna have anything to do with that. I won't, you know, I don't want to be part of your franchise anymore. Right. And to just keep myself clean. So, but when I tried to get out of the contract, they sued me. <laughs> so, and they, I ended up, um, I ended up reporting their wiretapping to the attorney general's offices while the lawsuit was going on of all of the two party states I got an attorney general's office investigation. It's now been sent to a U.S. attorney. And as part of the evidence in the lawsuit, I've had to use proof that I was against the wiretapping from Facebook posts and John DeLynn and <sighs> so ridiculous. Um, but, they won somehow, well, actually, I do know how, is that they had all of this money to attack me. They didn't like the fact that I was standing up to them, right? Now I'm just doing this for the umpteenth time, so it's feeling more natural to me. You know, but um, they won a no evidence motion, even though I had, I even have audio recordings of their illegal calls. They somehow won a no evidence motion and they won the lawsuit. So right now I owe them $350,000. It's being appealed. The U.S. attorney, I don't know what the judges are doing. The court system's a mess. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, the John DeLynn thing has become part of evidence of that. And whatever. There you go. All right. You didn't have to ask very many questions now, did you? Well, I do have some follow-up questions for you. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go all the way back to that um, trip to New York City. Okay. Um, that you said that he gave you that long hug at the end of that kind of where he had interviewed your husband and then your husband got up, went to take the kids and then he started to cry and he gave you that long hug. And at that point you said you knew that he was hitting on you because of some text messages and some other behaviors. Tell me more about those text messages and behaviors that led you to know that he was hitting on you. 
Um, because why would he invite me to be part of uh, an open table conference before a an open table discussion with really important people before a conference. Like, who am I really? I just, he was giving me special privileges that would be things that I wanted. Um, and and I, I think, I mean, that is what you said, or that is what I said. I remember as we were having this conversation, it's recorded. But I remember thinking he was hitting on me prior to that moment Because, and I hope I'm answering your question well, because like the memory in my mind is I'm sitting at the conference, which was before Planet Hollywood. And no, I guess that's true. I mean, John was looking at me in this really strange way. Like he was, he was eyeing me. But prior to that point when he had me, I guess he didn't really like, what is that? Why are you eyeing me that way? Mm. Like he was a, he was a stranger. <laughs> And he was someone I knew and he was paying a little bit of different special attention to me, but I didn't really know what. So yeah, I guess the way I said it, I don't know if that answers your question. I just, it was like, why, why is this person giving me this attention? Okay. That makes sense. In terms of the text messages that you had received at that point, what, what were those? They were just very, um, like on the morning of the conference, he texted me to come and give me this special opportunity to sit at the table with him and his buddies and this important person. Um, but I, I noticed when I started pulling out documents that I think Matt has now that, you know, you, you see even early on, he's asking questions about my husband. Um, in those written documents, which were even prior to this. And he, he had also, prior to this conference, he'd like start liking my photos on Facebook. Um, and then he had, prior to this conference as well, he had put me in this Mormon Stories podcast community and just made me an admin. He didn't tell me why. I was like, well, why am I an admin? I mean, are you going to give me information about that? I, like, I'm happy to help. I volunteered to help um did that answer your question mm -hmm. trying to when it was kind of confusing at the time so it's kind of confusing to okay and then so that first what you refer to as your first actual sexualized encounter with him mm -hmm. Salt Lake, where you had been at the park first. Right. Correct. And this was the, you're talking about it, the Quinn, because my memory's got it all with, with the conferences. Quinn. That's what I have it as. 2011, August. So yes. I realize this might be uncomfortable, but um, tell me about the actual sexual contact. Um, we were naked. And he had an orgasm. He had an orgasm? Yes. But not, not inside of me. Okay. How did that come about? Um, well, what I remember, I don't know how much detail to give you. is I don't, I guess I don't have a memory of all of it, but I remember it happening because I was on top of him and we were naked and he got really, really sweaty, like really, really, like so much sweat, um, more than I've ever experienced. That's really what I remember. It's the, how did it come about? Is not, I don't that's my, that's what I have in my memory. Okay. And you said before 
that when you were sitting at the park and he was rubbing your back, that mm-hmm. he was trying to convince you to get him or to get you to say yes for him to come into your hotel room. Right. Tell me more about that convincing. Um, well, I made it really clear that we weren't going to do that. So that's why we were going to the park. I want to make sure that, because what I see in my memory, I, mean, I have a very visual memory. So I like see the bench and I see him putting, I, I remember the feeling of his hands on my back. I don't necessarily remember words as well. Um, but it was like, I would, I can't, I don't have a good memory for words and I don't want to make up words. Okay. But it was, it was just a slow, no, we're not going to the hotel room. We're going to the park and we're going to spend time together. And he wasn't going, my plan when we went to the park wasn't that he was going to sit next to me and rub my back. You know, my plan was we were going to go to the park and we were going to walk through the park. Like instead we sat down on a bench and then he was rubbing my back. I mean, but I can't, it's just not the way my memory works. Okay. In both of these cases. So then after that Quinn podcast, there was the incident in DC in October and that was in the car, correct? Correct. And you said he had his hands in your pants? Correct. We were parked outside like... I don't know. We were in Washington, D.C., and I don't remember where it was, but I remember we were in this parking lot. Mm -hmm. There was this camera (laughs) because it was being surveilled because it was some sort of important federal building, and I don't know what. So I just remember the camera. His hand was in my pants, and I remember him. I remember a photo that someone took of him right after that incident in the car where he's like sprawled out on a bench and I'm just realizing, you know, he's, I look at the phone and I'm like, yeah, he's, he's horny. I mean, or because I know what happened right before that. And, but again, when you're getting images because that's how my memory works. Okay. So, um, When his hand was in your pants in the car, what was he doing? Um, he had his hands in my, in my vagina. Okay. And tell me about what you were doing while he was doing that in the car. Um, well, I was, in the, I was in my seat and he was in his seat. And I was enjoying it a little, then pushing his hand away a little, and then enjoying it a little. And then saying, there are cameras. Why are we doing this? Like, this is crazy. I don't like this. Look, there are cameras. You know, kind of like that. Um, you know, as I've looked back over it, thinking about how something like this happens, you know, my vulnerability, my need for attention, me loving him because of who I thought he was, because he really was portraying himself to be this person who I thought was amazing, who cared about the same things that I cared about, right? Um, But I've also just thought about a lot about the way people socialize and flirt and the interactions between men and women as these things come about. Um, You know, and so I was responding to those social cues, enjoying it and also being scared. And there's the camera and And, you know, maybe that, I, I, again, I don't want to put thoughts into his head, but, you know, maybe that's what he liked. A, a big part of this, from his perspective, if we try and make assumptions that we can't necessarily make about him, is that maybe he liked a woman who was going to be saying no a lot. And if we go back to in Idaho, he couldn't get an erection when I was the person who said, why don't we just have sex, right? 
maybe he liked the fact that I was a little scared of the cameras and that I was still responding to him positively, but I wasn't really responding to him positively because I was confused. You know, like that no, yes, no, yes, no. I think that my perception is that that would have been erotic for him. Okay. And how did he respond when you pointed out the cameras and tried he to... Laughed. He laughed and said, it's no big deal. Okay. Nobody's here. Nobody's going to catch us. You know, I'm like, but we're, I don't want to be on film. Right? Okay. And then the conference in November is okay. the LGBT conference. Right. And you said that you gave him consent to come into the hotel room and that he said to you that you were aware that this was not a quid pro quo. Right. Tell me what, tell me what that meant to you. At the time I didn't really um, know. And I'm not sure that I really like what it meant to me was you're taking responsibility for this end. Like, he's like, I don't have to come in. I won't come in. But if I do come in, I want you to know that you let me in. Okay. And I did let him in, right? So we have the, we have both sides of that. What is that? But that is what happened. Okay. And was there sexual contact that time? Yes, because this would have been, so the, the, I don't remember what it was, frankly. Um, because it wasn't what it wasn't, this was the time where it wasn't the first time. Right. And I, I hadn't gone all the way to, well, I hadn't moved forward in my thinking yet. So therefore I don't really have a strong memory of it besides that it occurred. Okay. And it, and it would have been naked and no sexual intercourse because that was the, that no sexual intercourse ever happened. Okay. And then the next conference was that January conference in Houston. Right. Which, do I have this correct? Before that conference occurred is where you gained your employee status. Yes. Okay. Prior to gaining your employee status, who would have been your supervisor as a volunteer? Nobody. Okay. I mean, the board, but I was on the board. So there's also some inurement and there are some other financial issues going on here um, that I think there's probably a pretty good record of. I mean, John even gets on his podcast and says, donate to me so that I can pay for my PhD and support my family. I mean, it's not like there's a lot really here that needs to be proven, but it wasn't ever his. And, and even there's a document that, uh, the document that Matt should have now about how when John was forming the 501c3, he he was looking for a way to really make it a way that he could make money that wouldn't be compliant with IRS regulations. So his, his objective was never to have an empowered board in that he, he incorporated in Arizona because in Arizona you only need one director as a 501 C three. And that's the only state where that can be because he didn't want to have an empowered board. But what happened through all of this was, and we haven't talked much about business, but there was a, a conflict between me and him because of course my idea is to put together this organization and a legitimate 501c3 where we have an empowered board and they know what's going on and they're making voting decisions, right? Well, his objective was to keep the board completely disempowered and not have any supervisors and just be able to run this really for-profit business without people knowing. So there was a board, but the board was never empowered until I frankly empowered the board against his will after I reported to Joanna Brooks. And then they tried to cover it up when I, in, I guess, early September, 2012, I sent them documents about their voting rights. I mean, like nobody, people were just doing what he said. Like, this is not a legitimate organization really functioning well here. It's just... If that makes sense, it's. So in terms of like organizing or spearheading the other volunteers, who, who 
did that. I did that. Okay. I did that and I helped select board members and I helped, I was working on trying to put a board together so we could have a legitimate board. And I was also figuring out what a 501c3 was and what, what it meant to manage it because I didn't come into this with that knowledge. Okay. Okay. So do I understand you correctly then? It was the way that this organization worked. It was John Delane, this board, which you were a part of, and then there were volunteers kind of all over the place that you sort of organized and put together to work at these different conferences and put this community together. Do I kind of have the right? Right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. There was. Yeah. Were there any other employees besides him and so, the board so, separate? So. He right at around the time or I guess there was another, so he had hired uh, Dan Weatherspoon, or I guess would say, I should say recruited Dan Weatherspoon to do the Mormon Matters podcast soon after the Marlon Jensen incident in which he was giving public criticism. And I reached out to him and was supportive of him despite public criticism because I didn't know well enough, which is somewhat significant because that's what he still is doing now. He is constantly moving through volunteers. People figure out that he's dishonest and then they start criticizing him publicly. And then he silences their voices by banning them and not allowing them to speak or threatening them with whatever he's going to do with his podcast that might hurt their reputations. And so they kind of disappear and become silent. And then new people come along who see his public status as well. He's been excommunicated for the church. He supports women and LGBT people. He seems like a nice guy. I want to volunteer for him. And so they come in and start supporting him. And I got a little bit distracted. That wasn't really your question, but I, that was really how it was working. That was how it was working when I came to other people had been, he had already offended other people and they knew that something was wrong. And I didn't yet. And so I came in and I flattered him. And then he's like, oh, look, she's flattering me. She loves me. Whatever. I'm going to use this situation if I'm trying to put myself in from his perspective, what he might see. Okay. Um, did you ever have the chance to see him interact with other, any other employees or volunteers for that matter? Um. I mean, at these conferences, he was interacting with people all the time, right? So there were, because all, ar all around us, we were surrounded by volunteers who were putting together these conferences. And of course, for a great deal of this time, I was still believing the stuff he was saying, like, oh, I love you or whatever. I mean, so... You know, as far as like him treating other people sexually, I own the only memory I have of seeing him of seeing that um, was at a restaurant somewhere. He walked up to some women and he was like being overly um, charismatic. I'm trying to think, what would be a good. You know, when he was around me, I was really his focus. And that's what I witnessed is when he was around me. Okay. But as far as him hitting on other women in front of me, you know, he did tell me about one other woman that he had um, maybe had some sexual relationship with something before, but what he told me was, that when he actually told me that when she wanted to have sex that he couldn't like 
the same thing that happened in Idaho. That was the bit of information that he gave me about this other woman. And that happened. He gave me that information in the summer of 2011 prior to us having any sex. Cause it was June. If we're dating this by conferences in my memory, it was June in 2011 where I went to the hotel room and nothing sexual happened. It was August where I went into the hotel room and the first sexual incident happened over that summer. We were talking a lot on the phone. Um, and it was during that time when we were talking on the phone that he gave me the information about that woman. And the information that he gave me was that when she really wanted to have sex, he couldn't. How did that talk, topic come up? <coughs> Again, unfortunately, I don't have the best um, memory for the words. So it turns into me wondering if I'm making stuff up. Okay. Like I remember, I remember things like that because that's not something you forget, but I, I would be making something if I told you what happened right before that. Okay. Fair enough. So I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just rubbing me. Okay. okay. So we are at that January conference in Houston. Okay. And the first night, although you had told him not to come in, he came in anyway. And then you said he had his hands underneath the blankets or the sheets. Yeah. So again, I'm going back to the best memory I have for me is images. Mm -hmm. So what I can say is that prior to this, I told him not to come. And I can say I have an image of in my mind being in my bed and all of a sudden his hands were under my sheets. I have that image in my memory. I have another image in my memory of, like I said, while I was telling you, him sitting against the wall in my room because there was like a little bit of light from the window shining on him and I can see him there. And I, while I see that in my memory, I feel like a little surprised or something. And I have an image in my memory of us standing together in the light um, hugging each other and unfortunately I can't sequence those in my memory like first second third like that's that's what I can give you and feel really accurate about you said something about him chasing you around the house and trying to get caught yeah tell me more about that um, I think the best example of that was in the June conference. So, but in this one, what I have a memory of is being under a bed, like I said. So again, you're getting the images that I have mm -hmm. rather than me trying to make sequences that may not be accurate. Right. Uh, so, and, and, I, and I often will remember feelings and thoughts when they're really strong with an image. And so the, what you're getting here is I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm under this bed and I'm worried about getting caught. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, I think that he enjoys me worried about being worried about getting caught. I think there's something about getting caught that's enjoyable to him. I'm having that insight in my memory. <laughs> so that's why you're like, and that's, I just don't know that I can give you more than that. That's accurate. Okay. Because, yeah. But I'm willing to keep trying, just don't want to make things up. And then, so the next conference is the February conference in Phoenix. Right. And that's where you, you had somebody else come pick you up. You were not going to stay at the host family. House. Right. Right. Um, you had your own hotel situation for the first night and then move. You did a woman's so. house, yep. There, the one thing that did happen at that conference was that we were supposed to meet everybody for pizza mm -hmm. at a restaurant. And I don't think anything sexual happened. Yeah. But he, he was driving and I was in the car with him this time. And um, 
instead of going to the restaurant, he went somewhere else and he wanted to spend time alone with me in the car. And so we had all these people in the communities waiting at the restaurant. Who do they want to see? They want to see him because he's the public figure. And he and I are in the car somewhere else. I'm just like, no, we've got to get to the restaurant. We're like, we're already 20, 30 minutes late. Like, um, so that happened. But I don't think anything, I don't have any memory of anything sexual happening in the car. Okay. Um, and do I recall correctly that Phoenix is where you woke up in that trailer and he was, yes, he was the there at the foot of the bed. Yeah. I have a memory. Again, you're getting my visual memory of being on this bed and he's kneeling at the foot of the bed. Okay. Um, but then nothing happened because I got up and I left the trailer and I went back into the house. Okay. All right. And at that point, um, I have a note here that that's where you said you started feeling this ethical dilemma. Yeah, around that time period. Well, no, I've been feeling the ethical dilemma like all along because the ethical dilemma is there. Like, okay. This is an obvious ethical dilemma from day one, from day one. But, um, and it was awful from day one. But it, at that point, it became just this constant, like, how do I, I, I guess what I should really say is, it was all from day one. I was thinking about the ethical dilemma from day one, but I started having these really disturbing thoughts about the ethical dilemma as it progressed and got worse. As the, situ as a, as the magnitude of my situation Um, came upon me. Is that right? Like, and just, and I started, I remember um, reading this book on an airplane and I'm not sure if it was to Phoenix or wherever, but that might be part of why I picked this up in my memory mm -hmm. is that it was a, it was a book about women's ethics and the way women see things ethically and there was something in that book about the way, I guess, the way. I guess, again, here you're getting my memory. I remember the book about the ethical dilemma. I remember reading the book about the ethical dilemma. I remember making those connections around the time I read the book. That was around the Phoenix time. My thinking changed around that time probably based upon the book in the way I described earlier in this interview which I think I got better at that point than I would get now because I was more in my memory at that point than I am now and yes the ethical dilemma was there from beginning to end the whole time you know what does this mean about my relationship with my husband does the consent my husband gave me extend to this point in time was my husband even like what's going on with that what about his wife what about all these people I mean that was all. Okay. But my thinking changed probably, yeah. I think the record you have is as accurate as we can get with that. Okay. And then, sorry about the cat. Um, I'm gonna jump forward to that conference in Salt Lake City in June, that following summer. Mm -hmm. Where you said that he was mean to start mm -hmm. until you agreed to be sexual with him mm -hmm. and his behavior changed. Right. Um, tell me more about that initial behavior that you were. That I described as me. Yeah. Well, again, we'll get my visual memories. Um, we were. I have a memory of us walking along State Street, another street we needed to go to. My children all play, well, my older two children play stringed instruments. And there is a place called Charles Lou Violins on State Street. And for some reason we weren't driving, I'm not sure, but we were walking there. And he was just walking ahead of me and he was kind of insulting me. Um, 
he sat in this violin shop with me while I exchanged violins for my children because we always had them make the violins and then I brought them back to Boston. And he was just like, this is a waste of my time. I don't like being here. It was just rude. Um, angry. I don't want you to be my employee anymore or whatever. I don't, again, I can't give you any accuracy on the verbal, but the emotional and how I felt like I just have this awful. Well, I mean, just, I get, I remember, I remember the physical sensation of just how much my chest hurt because he was being so mean to me and where we were. That's how my memory works. And then how did that sexualized contact, how did that, how did that develop out of his original behavior of being mean and insulting to you? How did that happen? I don't really, I mean, I can see the hotel room where we were. I can see that it was light. Mm -hmm. It was in the afternoon. I remember, I can remember how I was feeling. I don't remember, I don't remember what he might have said to elicit it or what I might have done to elicit it. I remember feeling awful and then it happening anyway. And then him being nice, like, yeah, I can't. Okay. I don't know. I mean, like you said, okay. I need to give you the I don't know on that. Yep. I appreciate that. Thank you. There were a couple of words, and that you said several times um, in your narrative that I'd just like to have you maybe expand upon if you can. Um, the first one being the manipulations on his end. Um, I know you talked some about some of the things that he said and some of your own internal feelings in terms of the weight of this project um, resting upon sort of that relationship between you and him seeming to be professional and, and okay. Um, but can you expand on that, on your sense of manipulation with him? It's hard when I'm not giving narratives because then it becomes my verbal description of the manipulations. Um, he does a lot of going to other people to get changes in behavior that he wants. So for example, if I said, no, I don't think that this conference or whatever it was should be this way, then he would go get other people to support his position and then have long conversations with them and then get criticism from them that he would come bring to me and say, so-and-so says these bad things about you. So he's constantly doing this teaming thing. Um, I don't think that was related to sex so much as just as an a general employment boundary issues all over the place. Unprofessional. I'm not sure of course in which places of the video recording I use those words so it's hard for me to go back to those places in my mind and like that could be a follow-up question I guess if we replay a part of the video and then say what do you mean more by that but okay is there any particular 
behavior or anything that stands out to you when um, when I give you back that word manipulation? Just shame. I mean, I think that he was using, I think he was intentionally using my shame and my ethical dilemmas that I felt all along because I, I'm an honest person. I never thought, I never imagined that I would be in this situation where I would have done something so dishonest, but he used that. It was my honesty that gave him power over me because I had done something wrong and I felt bad about it. And then I kept going, if that makes sense. So like, if we look at the, when he recorded me having the orgasm, right? He's taking an action against me that I am, I did have the orgasm, right? I did that. So I did something that we could say was ethically wrong, but then he records it and then he uses it. He commits the crime of recording it. And then he uses it to make me feel ashamed later by bringing it up to me that he used it. And so it's that I'm intentionally going to put Anne in a shameful situation. And then I'm going to use that shame against Anne and, and if we look at this in a, in a bigger way of, you know, how was he able to basically seduce me and put me into an ethical dilemma, which, yes, I consented to, and I don't want to say I didn't, especially in those beginning parts, but I also wasn't the person being targeted, or I also was the person being targeted, not the person doing the targeting. He gets me in that place, and then he has power over me because now he... he's out lying to the public about how he's a good family man. I'm, he doesn't really appear to care about the ethical dilemma. He's creating the ethical dilemma. And it's my position as of being the person who does care about the ethical dilemma that create, puts me in this awful place that then he can then exploit. So I guess I'm, I'm using the example of the crime to generalize to the whole situation if that makes sense okay and then the other word that i wanted to just bring back up to you um that you used was retaliation Mm -hmm. can you expand on that for me um well yeah like i reported him I didn't just go silent like I was silently like I was supposed to, right? And I, I, you know, I guess the reality is whether I had reported him or not, probably I would have st- def- I would have still been banned. I still would have been under the rug. Like all of these things that are considered legal retaliations or whatever that you're not supposed to do. He was just doing like he wasn't going to talk to me he was going to make sure I wasn't he was going but and then and then I mean he if we if we go back to the shame thing and I guess shame retaliation I don't know where but to go where my brain is like he knew that I would be so ashamed about the publicity of this but from his perspective like look he's just got to do a repentance because then he can get his Mormon repentance. And he was the man. And he had this, uh, quote, attempted affair, whatever people are calling it publicly, um, that he can kind of feel proud about because he was able to maybe get Anne to be sexual with him. And he can advertise that. He can go to his, he can go to his workshops and sell it because he now is back together with his wife and they have a happy marriage. Um, All of those things are shame. Like, so for example, and I guess we could put the word retaliation. He's trying to get me. He's trying to hurt me. Like when, when he withdrew from that conference in Sunstone, at Sunstone in 2014, when he had all of this publicity that he was getting, he, he made a big deal out of withdrawing. But then, you know, I had one of my colleagues come up to me about, because I've had him 
blocked on Facebook for a long time about some Facebook post he'd meant saying, oh, I'm really so sorry, I can't be there. You know, he's like making a big point about how he's withdrawing so that everybody will look on their Facebook so they'll all look at me at the conference. At least that's how I, like, he's drawing attention to me intentionally to shame me to make it, because, you know, what, what I wanted was just to be professional and go on and not, not be here having this interview. I just wanted to live my life. But no, I have to, this, he, want, he wanted my identity to be tied up in this. In fact, in addition, because he, he wanted me destroyed, like he, I was supposed to be under the rug, but he also, like, um, so I guess I didn't tell you about this, but so, oh, I didn't tell you about this. I skipped this. So part of the narrative, I guess. Um, so the charge through the New Hampshire Human Rights Commission just sat because I was working on my divorce. But there, it, there came a point in time when the commission needed to investigate it, which was good. I wanted it investigated. Somebody ought to investigate this at some point. Um, but it turned out that he didn't have enough employees for the Human Rights Commission in New Hampshire to take jurisdiction because it needed six employees in New Hampshire. But when New Hampshire looked at the information they sent, he was in pain. He was paying his contract employees so little for their podcasting that the charge just had to be withdrawn or that I was going to lose. I guess I should put it. I was going to lose the investigation on point number one, which would have been how many employees there have. And the rest of it was never going to get investigated. Okay. Cause the commission was only going to get so far as do we have jurisdiction? No, we don't have jurisdiction over. So I knew that if there was, that if I went forward with the investigation, I would lose based on jurisdiction. So I spent a lot of time talking to my attorney about how to respond to this, considering all of the publicity. And um, we were trying to negotiate with John for some sort of settlement. And during that negotiation, you know, the things that are important to me are his publicity things, all the things he's doing to try and shame me publicly. Well, he can take credit because he's a man for having seduced Anne or whatever, he takes credit, but I get shamed publicly. So it's a proud moment for him that he can have all these conferences or, or excuse me, he can run these workshops about how he put his, what, his marriage back together with his wife, but it's a shameful moment for Anne. So I, of course, during those negotiations, I was like, well, I'm just trying to, like, can you, can you unban me from Facebook groups? Can you, can you promise never to talk about the hit piece again? Because... I guess I can't remember when the hit piece was finally released. I don't remember if this was before that. But we have these really silly little settlement things going back and forth, which from my perspective were all about how can I keep this public shaming from getting worse by getting him to be quiet about something. Mm -hmm. And it was just going nowhere and he wouldn't even pay. He wouldn't even cover. So his, his attorney fees are getting paid for by the donors, right? I don't have anyone paying my attorney fees or helping me. And um, he, he won't even agree as part of the settlement to even cover my attorney fees. He it was like, I don't know, I have to look at the documents, like 3,000 bucks or 2,000, I don't know, almost nothing, to get the NDA signed. And then at that point, we'd both be signing NDAs. But here my problem is at that point, well, Maybe, but you've already publicized all of this. Like you wouldn't sign the NDAs in 2012. You know, we wouldn't sign the confidentiality agreements in 2012 so that I would be safe. Instead, now it's all been publicized. You've already bragged to the world about this or whatever that means. So why should I sign a confidentiality agreement at this late point in time when you're not even willing to cover my attorney fees and the negotiations we're having are over silly little things like that really have no significance. Um, so at that point, what I decided to do with my attorney was withdraw the charge. So I wouldn't lose the investigation on jurisdiction. And but before I withdrew the charge to file a document with the New Hampshire human rights commission that was more detailed than most attorneys would advise. Um, because attorneys, are constantly saying, say, you know, say nothing, do nothing, because we're going to go to court, whatever. And they're always preparing for that court moment. And, you know, he was just really good. He'd done some social justice work before, you know, and it's like, well, 
he, he agreed to it. And I ended up filing a document that was more detailed. And I haven't found a copy of that document yet. I actually lost my copy of it, but hopefully it's in a file and I can scan it um, for Matt. And if not, it's filed at the Human Rights Commission in New Hampshire. So, and it's on my computer somewhere. It just wouldn't be the notarized version of it. Um, so I filed that document and withdrew. And at the same time, I went to a message board called mormondiscussions.com and I started posting about it and my message to John was, and it was because I found that message. So I was really communicating with John, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, my message to John was, I'm not going to be quiet. I'm not going to sign your NDAs. I'm not as afraid anymore. You've already publicized this. I'm coming to this message board that I know you read to start talking about it while the attorney things are going on because we can't get anywhere and you've already publicized it. Um, and so this is just me kind of getting my voice and starting to be strong and starting to realize, you know, this is never, going, I'm never going to get what I want, wanted, which was confidentiality and being able to fix my life after such a horrible experience. That's what I wanted, but he made that impossible. And then he wouldn't even agree to a fair, he wouldn't even cover my attorney fees. So, I was like, well, I just have got to have the strength to talk about this because this happened and you're still doing it. This is still going on. I mean, I don't, of course, I don't know what all is going on, but it's not stopping. It didn't stop with me. So um, so yeah, I mean, that's what I did. Oh, and this was the, this is what I was going to get to. So the first thing he did when he got to the um when i started doing on the message board i guess i shouldn't say first thing always trust the written record but he went there and he doxed me and he puts it there and the reason why i chose this message board because i was i was being smart and strategic was because there's um protection for using real names there because i knew all along that one of the things he wanted to do was publicly shame me using my real name and that was one of the arguments that i had with the osf board from the beginning was because he was going on this publicity thing. I was like, you can't just use my name. You can't make this my identity on the internet for the rest of my life because he wants to have this public repentance and excommunication thing. Like I get some protection here. I get some privacy. <laughs> um, so that was one of the, the arguments that was going on at the time of my termination was, you know, what does he have a right to say and not say? And he ended up not using my name in the podcast, just referring to me in the podcast or, the, or well, just making it so that people who knew enough would know so he could do his little bragging thing. But then, but then, you know, as soon as I started standing up to him online, then it was like, let's put her name out there. Mm -hmm. So I used the rules of the message board because I was thinking ahead knowing I was going to do that to get the administrators to take my name off and to challenge him on it. But then at that point, other people knew who I was. So then there were like people tweeting about it. So like for a year and a half, while I'm going through this divorce, trying to figure out how I'm going to support my family, et cetera. Anybody, time, anytime anybody Googled me, they, if you Googled my name, you just see right at the top, what about John Dillon's affair or whatever it is with, you know, and of course if you don't Google, if you Google John's name, you don't get that because he's got all this SEO power because he's a public figure. So he was always trying to get my name out to hurt me and to make me to use that. Again, if we go back to the shame that he wanted to inflict on me, if we want to go to the manipulation, the shame, it's like you get, you, you want to have power over a, a woman in right now. And you can, you can seduce that woman and then you can shame her into silence or whatever you want, because the, I mean, people will praise him, but shame me. And he, he was using that. And even, this is in Matt's um, records, like even more recently when somebody, when other people started standing up to him because I was, what I was posting, they, I had someone come to me. He's like, look, you're getting your voice. You're talking on this message board. So he went to the Mormon Stories podcast community and tried to use my real name in the Mormon Stories podcast community, um, thinking that 
that was okay with me. And I got a text from John saying, oh, can we use your, norm, your real name in the Mormon Stories podcast community? Because, you know, it, it was just always him trying to get my name out. And so I responded to that by saying, Rosebud, which is the, my, my name on the message board is, we can all, t- since you wanted to talk about this, we're all going to talk about it, but we're not going to use my name. And that's my response to John's attempt as a retaliation from the beginning to, I'm under the rug. I can't speak. He's got the podcast. So he can say his side to a hundred thousand people or however many people he wants. He can always give them his PR version, but I'm, I can't say anything. And anytime he can get my name out connected with it so that he, I don't have SEO power. You know, it's just, it's a way of silencing me. It's a way of shaming me. It's a way of hurting me um, and hurting me in a way that affects my whole life. I mean, right now on the internet, you know, so I've changed my legal name. Um, and I don't want that Matt on anything public because I don't want anyone looking. I, just, I need, you know, I, I changed my legal name. I figured out how to um, make it so that since we were going to talk about this publicly, because he started that conversation that when we talk about it publicly, we're not going to be using my legal name. And that's in response to his attempt to hurt me by using my legal name. Um, you know, this is, this is the opposite of, you know, what I thought about it in those beginning days when I was like, Oh, this is a real affair. Right. (laughs) Or we're, or I'm really in love or whatever it is, you know, no, this is a controlling horrible man who's using sex and shame intentionally. Not only does he get sex that he wants, but he can shame me into whatever kind of silence. I mean, one interesting thing that he always said um, during the sexual moments, he was like, this is only for you, Anne. You know, I'm going to make you feel so good. It's only for you. Like, you know, and there's the more naive times when I was like, oh, that's really sweet at the very beginning. And then there's like the, yeah, really? <laughs> and what, and when is it ever only for the woman? I mean, that answers your manipulation question type thing. So... And retaliation. So yeah, it's been it's been a long journey to like, okay, I need to speak about this. And but again, if I could have just figured out a way to go away safely, obviously I, that would have been my preference. I don't think he expected me or anyone to stand up to him. I I honestly have had thoughts at times like he just wanted me to kill myself. I mean, I don't know if that's true, but computer's doing something. Doing something. I missed. I missed the last. Oh, um, sorry. I said. I. I you probably heard part where I said, "Well." It seemed at times like he just, he would, he wanted me to kill myself. I don't know if that's true. I'm not in his brain. I said, but he certainly hasn't shown me any compassion. You know, another interesting thing he said to me once was he said, why don't you have an eating disorder? I was like, I don't know, because I think it's important to feed myself. I don't, I I understand that people have eating disorders and that's hard for them, but this is not something I'm vulnerable to. And I, I remember when he said that, um, thinking about the fact that this other woman that he had told me about that he'd had the sexual relationships with has an eating disorder. And she told me that her, I know who she is. I'm not going to give the name, but that was information that she had given me and that he had given me so that I, you know, and I think his wife has an eating disorder I'm the question, why don't I have an eating disorder? I'm like, why would I have an eating disorder? Right? That's just a random thing that he said. Hmm. So I guess I could, I have a, I have a thought about that that may or may not be true. Um, 
as far as I'm now I'm projecting myself into him, which I can't really do. So I'm acknowledging that I'm projecting myself into him. Um, but I think that there were some very, some things that he would have seen in my situation um, that demonstrated that I was vulnerable and a good target. Um, the interviewing my husband, um, I also tend to be very quiet. I don't like publicity. There I am. I don't like publicity. I like my privacy. Um, and then I, I think, but there are also some things about me that maybe he didn't um, evaluate maybe thoroughly enough as I, I tend to be someone who stands up for the small people and who stands up. I tend to be, I'm a very strong, powerful person too. So it was like he, he got the vulnerability, but he also got at the same time the strong, powerful person. And I think, again, if I'm projecting myself into him now and acknowledging that I can't necessarily do that, that could have been a downfall in the situation because he didn't necessarily expect me to succeed with all of these conferences and these groups, right? He didn't expect this to necessarily turn into the predicament that he found himself in. If I had been, so we could, we could go back to why was I a stay at home mom instead of in the work world? Well, there were a lot of reasons that have to do with what I think the kind of treatment I think children should get and what they deserve from parenting, as well as my own family situation with my ex-husband. You know, I didn't really have the opportunities that a lot of other people would have because of what I was dealing with at home. So maybe I was both vulnerable and less vulnerable than some other people. And that's how this whole situation happened because if I hadn't been so successful, then it wouldn't have turned into what it was. And then he wouldn't have had as much to cover up and then he wouldn't like, so it just kind of, again, speculating and moving outside of what we don't necessarily know and don't know. Am I different than other people that he may have targeted in the past who maybe did have eating disorders? I don't know. I don't have any information about that. All I do know is he said, why don't you have an eating disorder? And I thought, why would I? That makes sense. So, so I don't. Ooh, I don't. Ooh, I don't. Type any other questions. Any questions. 